Good, good morning, everyone. Oh, let's greet everyone. Uh, good morning, and hope you are all in good health. No? So, <clears throat> we are still 17. I hope uh, your other classmates will also join us this morning as we try to finish our discussion on uh, the design thinking process. So, hopefully, everybody will be here this morning. Okay. Uh, for those who are here, uh, I would like to thank you uh, guys, gals, for making it here for coming to this class religiously as, as per schedule. And I just want to tell you, um, if you hear about some background noises, there is actually an ongoing leadership seminar or webinar that we were asked to attend that uh, I said I'll just record it in the background while we're having our classes. So it seems like I cannot afford to miss this class anymore. So we'll just continue on. And if you will hear those background noises, please bear with us. So I'm having difficulty loading my um, PowerPoint slides. So it seems like I have a um, problem with my, um, what we call the, PowerPoint um, execution file. All right, so since you are here early, um, yeah, I, I don't want also to waste your time. No? So if, if you can proceed no? so for the benefit of those who are early, I just want to continue on with our discussion as much as we want to wait for the other classmates. I hope na mahaw na mo. No, so, ako, I have yet to um, have my breakfast. We're having some early problems with our, um, our house here. Um, okay, I, I have to share the PDF because I cannot open yet my, uh, so my um, PowerPoint. So, kani sa akong issue sa inyo. I hope okay lang. Uh, PDF na nasa ano, um, in view of the, the uh, so window of this PowerPoint uh, board. Hello, good morning everyone, and, uh, since, since and welcome to the third series of the Irish Leadership Legacy Forum from Laboratory to Life Changing Solutions. Um, it's all rise I, for the national, multinational anthem. Mga kababayan, ang pampansang awit ng Pilipinas. Pasig President so, and Batangas State University President Tirsa Ronquillo, so, State guys, Presidents uh, of State Universities and Colleges, Vice Presidents, uh, Directors and Officials uh, of State Universities and Colleges, and, and, and Private Higher Education Institutions, Honorable uh, Researchers and Scientists, our distinguished speakers, uh, Mr. Jose Avellino, uh, Jojo Flores, and Mr. David Cutler and Ms. Tamara Meckler. Esteemed reactors, uh, led by President Cecilia Gascon, 
so, of Bulacan State University, Dr. Al Serafika of the Irish Scientific Board, Dr. Drandra Earl Wanico of Technological Institute of the Philippines, representing President Elizabeth Lajos. Engineer Albert San Amante, Vice President for Research and Extension, Batangas State University. Mr. Alberto Quirio, Executive Vice President of Polytechnic University of the Philippines, representing President Manuel Muhi. The 2021 Iris Leadership right. Legacy Forums by the Institutes for Research, right, so Innovation, morning, and Scholarship um, okay, in this, partnership um, with Elsevier provides a common ground for strategic so thinking and reflection on frontier-seeking leadership in universities and scientific research yeah, institutions. So that's, that's really true. To refresh okay. our memories a bit, Thank you. We started our conversations in the first series with global metrics of academic and innovation excellence with Professor Fauzi Ismail of University Technology Malaysia and Mr. Jerome Brinson and E. Wei Chong of Asia Pacific QS University Rankings. About two weeks ago, in the second series, we were joined by Dr. Raymond Tan and Dr. Carlos Primo de Vid as they took us through the process of branding excellence in the La Salle University and the University of the Philippines. Today, we will talk about making research make sense to everyday living as we talk about life-changing solutions from conceptualization in the laboratory to possible commercialization. So to get us into the groove, I wish to introduce our distinguished speakers for the third series Iris Legacy, like Iris Leadership Legacy Forums. Tamara Meckler is the co-founder of Fortuna Cools, a startup building sustainable coolers made of coconuts to replace plastic foam insulation once and for all. Tamara studied at Stanford University where she earned a BS in Behavioral Biology and an MS in Conservation and Sustainable Development. While at Stanford, Tamara was trained in human-centered design, a methodology right. that she has applied um, over the last three years, co-designing products with small-scale uh, fishing uh, and farming in communities in the, in the Philippines. Before founding yeah, Fortuna like Cools, uh, Tamara worked on community-based so, conservation uh, and environmental really education the projects in the United the States and in, her, and, and in her home countries, Spain and Mexico. Really David Cutler founded Fortuna Cools uh, alongside Tamara uh, and so partners across the Philippines in 2018. So, Prior yeah, to Fortuna um, Cools, David worked as a data management consultant for social enterprises in South and Southeast Asia. David studied politics at Middlebury College and received a master's in environmental policy from Stanford University. We shall then be joined by Giorgio Flores, Jose Avellino, Giorgio Flores, co-founder of Plug and Play a Silicon Valley-based technology startup accelerator, which he started in January 2006. Plug and Play accelerates over 2,000 tech startups from all over the world, and that is annually in 35 global offices, which acts as a network of angel investors, venture capital firms, and over 520 large corporations. Since inception, Plug and play. Um, plug and play startups have been able to raise in excess of nine billion US dollars in funding. Plug and play ventures have over one thousand companies in its portfolio with fourteen unicorns, including PayPal, Dropbox, Landing Club, N26, Soundhound, Honey, Garden Health, among others. In the Philippines, Georgia is co-founder of Launch Garage which started operations in March 2016. Patterned after plug and play, Launch Garage is an accelerator and investor in tech startups in the Philippines and the ASEAN region. And he currently advises over startups in the country, in over uh, a number of startups in the country, including Pearl Play, Tangerine, Taksumo, 
nagpahay Mober Galileo, among others. In addition, Jojo serves as a board member and vice president in Science Technology Advisory Council to the Philippine government and leading universities, helping them bridge technology entrepreneurs to Silicon Valley. He is also a board of trustee at De La Salipa, as well as a board member at Animal Labs ICAST of De La Salle University. Jojo completed his BS Business Administration Studies at the University of the Philippines, Diliman. Our moderator for today is Dr. Carlos Primo de Vid, Professor of Geology and Environmental Sciences at the University of the Philippines, Diliman, and Chair of the National Panel of Experts of the Climate Change Commission. But before all of these friends, let us first listen to Dr. Francis Baleta, Chief Scientific Officer of the Iris Digital Commons, who will give us very quick updates on what's happening now with the Iris Digital Commons. Dr. Francis Baleta, the floor is yours. Thank you, Dr. Nap. Others, no? allow other people, the state allow presidents the users, and officials of universities um, and colleges and private institutions in the Philippines, our distinguished and speakers for today's forum, our panel of reactors, right? so representatives from we, our partner institutions, imagine, friends, uh, ladies and gentlemen, a pleasant morning. I will be presenting the updates on the Iris Digital Commons. So this Three weeks ago, on March 26, we witnessed we the formal launching of this site of the IRIS Digital Actually, Commons during the second IRIS Leadership Legacy one. Forum for 2021. Our dedicated support from the press uh, Elsevier, based in the United uh, States, presented to us the features of the pre-launch site of the IRIS DC, and three days after the launch, we already witnessed and accessed the live site of the IRIS Digital Commons. We can view the live site at tc.theiris.edu.org. We had a series of training calls, particularly on site administration, manual and batch uploading of documents, Scopus harvesting tool and other technical features of the live site. On April 7, we had our first meeting with the content officers, IT experts, and select representatives from our partner institutions. And during this meeting, we discussed and edited the provisions of the memorandum of agreement between IRIS DC and the partner institutions. No, the role of the content officers and IT experts were so, also discussed uh, and other important matters example, pertaining to our partnership. No? So, we already sent out to email the edited version of the MOA for review by the con uh, concerned authorities for, uh, of our partner institutions. Really for While waiting for the review and comments of the memorandum of agreement, so Tomorrow, like April 16th, we will uh, have our second uh, meeting with the content officers the and IT experts. And during this meeting, our dedicated support from BPRESS, Digital Commons, uh, LCBR based in the United States, will provide the first of a series of training calls for our content officers and IT experts. The training call will focus on uploading of files and scopus harvesting tools and the features of our live site. I will send the link to our meeting details and other materials for tomorrow's meeting after our event today. As soon as we leave the MOA with our partner institution, we will post our first call for submissions of a collection. Then, between May and June, series of meetings will follow to discuss and upload our initial collections. We are planning to launch the live version of our site containing our initial collection and track the readership and other metrics for uh, the collect collections that we uploaded. By the end of June, we are excited to be working with you and we look forward to featuring the outstanding accomplishments and notable contributions of our Filipino scientists to the world. The Iris Digital Commons, branding Philippine excellence. Good morning. Thank you, thank you very much, Dr. Francis. And so, without uh, further ado, may I now give the floor to uh, David Cutler and Tamara Meckler and to Dr. Sipidovit, who will be moderating the entire session 
for this morning. So, I know guys, and so, um, ladies and gentlemen, you, you Dr. Sipi David, so David if you have and Tamara, thoughts, the floor is yours. Try, um, Good morning, you everyone. You Thank you, Dr. Nab and uh, Dr. Baleta, right? for the updates on the digital okay. commons. So, in another, about so four years ago, I received an email of, uh, from two Stanford you, students, David and Tamara, and they specifically mentioned that the they were already here in the country doing a project. To, so it's just, I, now, I today, just everyone, you will be able to listen to the to journey that, that David around, and Tamara and has embarked on from the academe. I mean, to their immersion the program here in the Philippines, to doing to research the on the their intended so product, and say, finally so moving on to so commercializing the product. The the their, their story so is definitely something to emulate. To capture, and for and all of our researchers in, product, in this webinar who are also aspiring to have their research translated wow. into actual products that can have an impact on society and the economy, their, their story is something to listen to. And so without much further ado, let's listen to David and Tamara as they talk about design thinking and product design and commercialization. The floor is yours, David and Tamara. Hi, guys. Hello. Thank you so much, Dr. CP and Dr. Napoleon, for, for the introduction. and. Um, for having right. invited us to share right. our journey with such a so such a distinguished group and to share the stage with um, right. so Jose Avellino as well. So it's uh, it's really an honor to have been invited to thanks to the IRIS Network and I hope that we can share an interesting uh, story with you uh, uh, that might inspire some ideas as Dr. Sipi was saying um, for using design thinking to develop impactful uh, solutions alongside local communities. So in terms of the uh, organization of a product, David, do you want to <laughs> before I get into it? No, we're 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 honored to be here. Um, I was admiring the the guest list. It's great to see um, folks and friends and colleagues across the Philippines. So um, thanks once again for the invitation, and we're excited uh, to to present a little bit about our backstory, how we got here, and also really looking forward to to the discussions and and learning from from all of you. So um, tomorrow, let's let's dive right in. Sure. So David and I founded a company called Fortuna about three years ago. And what we do is make coolers out of coconuts um, that we source from small scale farmers in Bicol. So we'll tell you more about our coconut coolers in just a little bit. But first, we're going to share with you the story of how we got started. So and our first product was actually not made of coconuts. It was a collapsible cooler that, that was insulated with conventional that materials that was designed for the hundred thousand thousand small scale tuna fishermen in Southeast Asia that do not have any at sea cold storage. Uh, as you probably know, all around the Philippines there are small scale fishermen that mass, are actually catching really big fish, of, uh, huge tuna that uh, are actually now, so big uh, that they don't fit in their cooler and often they just barely fit in the boat. Then, but they still very, have to keep nice the fish cold to be able to you, sell them at a good price. And so this is actually a problem that is faced by thousands of fishermen, not only in the Philippines, but across uh, communities around the world that live near tuna migratory highways. And so fishermen like Lewis, pictured in this photo, catches giant yellowfin by handline just a few miles away from shore, in this case, in the Laganoi Gulf. But for lack of a cooler, lets it spoil in the sun for hours while fishing before selling it in the local market at local prices. So how did we figure this out? That's one of the questions that people always ask us and that they're always most interested in hearing uh, how the idea for our work was born. So how did two graduate students from Stanford University all the way in California end up making coolers for fisher folk in the Philippines? And so Fortuna was actually born out of a class at Stanford Design School and it started out as a grad school project through a program called Design for Extreme Affordability. So just to give a little bit of background on this program, uh, Design for Extreme Affordability teaches students how to design products and services that will change the lives of the world's poorest citizens. And they do so by partnering student teams with international organizations um, on solving real world problems. So to date, there have been 634 students 
that have worked with 63 international partners on 158 projects that have impacted millions of people worldwide. And by the end of the course, the solutions can either be handed off to the local partner organization for implementation, or to another appropriate organization, or like in our case, the students can choose to establish a startup to continue to see the, the, the project forward and implement it themselves. Um, so I'll tell you a little bit more about how we went through that process. Um, but just to share also that uh, although this program is set up to work with international program uh, with international partners, this year due to COVID, the class was fully remote and students actually partnered with local organizations in California and worked on a range of local challenges like environmental equality, housing access, um, food waste reduction, and access to remote healthcare. So I think this, this proves that this sort of partnership model between students and social organization can be replicated at any scale. And so in this course, uh, we were taught the human-centered design approach, which some of you might already be familiar with. And it's essentially a problem-solving process that is broken down into five steps. And the main uh, idea, the, the main point of this process is that one really needs to be able to understand understand the people that one is designing for and the problem to be addressed. And in order to do that, you can go through uh, these five steps. So empathizing, defining, ideating, prototyping, and testing. And the common theme through, through all of these steps is that you need to be in conversation with the people on the ground in order to develop the most impactful solution. And so it was by going through these steps that we discovered uh, that fishermen like Lewis, pictured in the photo previously, needed a cooler that would fit big fish in small boats. So to take you a little bit um, more step by step through this process, um, it started out in our case in a small fishing community in Occidental Mindoro on an island called Lubang, which maybe some of you are familiar with. And so this was the emphasized step. So as students, when we were back at Stanford, we were partnered and introduced to RARE, which is a marine conservation NGO in the Philippines, and they invited us to get to know the fishing communities that they work with. These were the people that we were going to be designing for, so at this stage we really wanted to know everything about the current situation of the fish people in these communities. So what do they catch? Um, where do they go out fishing? How long do they go out fishing? How many people per boat? Really trying to gather as much information about the environment um, so and, and the people that we were designing for. But it's not just about asking questions, it's also about interacting with the people directly. So um, living in the fishing community, seeing their practices and putting ourselves in their shoes. And so we actually spent weeks first and then months living with the fishermen in Lubang and brainstorming with the fisher folk. And during this step, we were learning about everything as it related to our users. But of course, at a certain point, you have to so narrow in. So what is the question that we're trying to answer? So we have to define the problem that we are working to solve. So when Rare approached us, their goal was for us to work with them in order to improve the livelihood of fishermen. But that was too broad. We had to define a specific and actionable challenge. And that challenge through all of that empathizing work turned out to be that small scale fishermen do not have the means to maintain the quality of they catch while they're out at sea. We always have referred that to that as so that was kind of uh, a, a couple minutes that took us a few months uh, or, or a year or so in, in real life of, of getting to know um, tons and tons of people at every uh, step in this process and um, just really putting in, in a lot of time uh, with with users or, or just regular people um, at, at every at every step um, of this uh, fish supply chain. I want to just share a little bit about um, some of the surprising things that we we learned along the way. And one of the reasons why it's so important to really spend that time is to kind of figure out some of these um, hidden little secrets that will ultimately be kind of a make or break element about whether the product or the service that you design is, is really going to be implemented. Um, so I, I apologize, it's a bit of a graphic image if you're not familiar with uh, fish biopsies, but um, this is sort of how yellowfin tuna are graded. 
And the difference between um, these two biopsies is the difference between hundreds and hundreds of pesos uh, per, per kilogram. Um, you can see that it, the, the grade of the yellowfin tuna is written down um, A or B. Uh, is is often how it's recorded, um, and and that uh, is is recorded right at the right at the beach, and that determines how much the fisherman gets paid. So this was sort of our initial insight, and we wanted to make sure that we could help as many fishermen as possible return those uh, yellowfin tuna at A grade instead of B grade, um, and and earn more. And the thinking behind that was. Um, you know, you see, you see these fish uh, that, that we saw at the, the market in Bentangas, in Iloilo. Um, you see some of the, the fish being sold at Farmer's Cubao. Um, and you see actually that same fish uh, here in, in California being sold for uh, $28 a pound. That's like seventy dollars, or, or you know, thirty-five hundred pesos per uh, per kilogram um, when it's exported. It's all the same fish, and so we thought, you know, can't we just raise up the the, the quality of the fish, and won't the fishermen just get paid more? Well, of course, there's there's a big system that this works within, and it was really trying to understand that system um, that that we kind of embarked on, on this journey, and and the reason we've had any success so far is um, both understanding that system and finding the right partners to work with at every step. And what we discovered was that um, at the at sea cold storage problem was the big missing piece, but it was really only one link in the journey of that fit fish uh, from the time it's caught to the time that it reaches uh, my my plate here in, in California. Um, and it's only by having that entire chain work out uh, just right and keeping that fish fresh at every at every step that um, the fish will be worth that much and that the fisherman can realize um, that extra gain in, in his income. Um, and so we not only had to design a product that fishermen love to use, but we actually had to find partners who were willing to ensure that the fish was kept cold um, on land as well. So we had to figure out, you know, where are these existing cold chains? Um, where are they working well? And in those places, we could really target as our early adopters because it was in places like this. Um, here's a picture of Tobacco City and Albay, um, where the rest of that cold chain was in place. We didn't have to build the entire cold chain um, from scratch, but it was only that at sea part that was missing. And so by plugging into these supply chains and really finding um, the, the partners to make this whole system click, um, we could really work on this final final element and this final solution um, and, and really kind of plug into a, to a larger story here. So that's just a, a little piece about the partnerships that we've really relied on along the way. Um, and tomorrow we'll, we'll kind of tell you what we did with some of, this, some of these uh, insights when we sat down to actually um, come up with, with solutions to work on. Usually we'll have this kind of... Uh, right, so uh, uh, as David was just mentioning, now that we had defined uh, the problem uh, and really studied the entire the system and learned from the local people pieces, and from all of the partners uh, that were necessary to, you know, for all of the pieces okay. of, Anyhow, of the network, uh, we, we jumped into the uh, ideating uh, uh, so this is when we let our minds go really wide and explore the whole world of potential ways that we can address the problem that we had identified. And so a common tool at the design school is using post-its to just put on the board whatever ideas come up um, without filtering oneself. So we could, we started thinking we could redesign the fishing boat to include a shaded area so that the fish was not in direct sunlight. Or we could try to make longer lasting eyes. You know, we, we came up with dozens of ideas from very simple solutions to crazy seemingly impossible ones but that's sort of the goal of this process and very quickly we started to organize our ideas into themes and transition into oh, prototyping we? we started with very low resolution prototypes so on the bottom right one of my personal favorites is a boat yes. with a shading panel no. that oh. maybe had a solar okay. panel on it um, on the left it was an idea for right. a neoprene so suit for tuna that. A lot of these, I don't remember what the original idea was, but being able to create something physical from the ideas that we had put on post-its allowed us to get more insight into what a solution might look like and what some of the problems or opportunities in that space might be. And our most promising prototypes slowly became higher resolution, so we put more time and effort into each one. And a really important part of this step was actually prototyping with our users. So here you can see Edgar, who is a small scale tuna fisherman from Long Island, who came up with a ton of ideas. Every day we would show up um, 
to the community, I, show oh them our prototypes and get feedback from them. Uh, and, and they so really came up with, example, with amazing insights. So over the course of a couple of months, we built more so than a dozen prototypes and incorporated so the user's feedback into change. each iteration. And then we tested our prototypes. So with each use, we learned new things about the needs of our users. This cooler that we were designing had to meet certain requirements that maybe were not apparent from the beginning, but once our users started testing them, it started to, to, come, to become more clear. So for example, um, it needs to keep the ice frozen for more than 24 hours because that's often how long the fishermen are going out to sea. It needs to have certain features, like for example, being collapsible for days with no catch because space is really constrained in these really small boats. Or it needs to be extra durable because it's going to be handled very roughly so we, through testing it was that we were able to discover uh, a lot of these opportunities in the design of the product the other thing that we learned about testing was that um you know the fishermen actually had to enjoy using the products uh you know it, it wasn't enough just to solve a very technical problem but we actually had to make a product that fishermen were excited to use and that weren't just simply getting in their way so part of the you know part of the process was making sure that it would keep uh, fish fresh like you're seeing in this picture but um we discovered pretty quickly that that wasn't the only thing that our cooler had to do and there were all these other you know fairly simple in in so retrospect that, usability um, features nice. that were actually just as important as kind of the technical uh, performance characteristics um so this is kind of a an interesting photo um, again these things seem a bit obvious in retrospect but were not necessarily obvious to us at the time um so we were basically asking fishermen to bring an extra piece of gear with them uh, to their boat from their house and of course fishermen walk to their boat loaded down with all sorts of their other fishing gear and so they often go to their boat you know in the middle of the night and were we really going to ask fishermen to make an entire extra trip from their house to their boat just to carry the cooler or was there a way that we could sort of add a backpack strap um, a shoulder strap so that they they could you know throw the cooler on their back collapse it and it would be very convenient and it wouldn't really be an extra burden for them um, and so that was like, that was just like a hit with the fishermen and it just made it a more exciting um, and, and just a much easier product to, to integrate into their sort of everyday lives and their, and their existing habits. Um, this one is uh, a, sort of a, another, another kind of common feature that we heard. Um, it's kind of a goofy picture, but it's actually a, a pretty serious um, issue. And that is, um, you know, small scale fishing is an incredibly dangerous job and pretty much all of the fishermen we knew at one time or another have capsized in the middle of the ocean um and the, you know people sort of laugh it off in in the the, the very typical um, filipino fisherman style and and have a, an amazing attitude about it but it is a very risky job and one thing we we heard oftentimes was that you know we're we're basically giving them a huge extra piece of, of fishing gear um can it also be a piece of safety gear um and so uh the 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 way the easiest way to make it into a piece of safety gear was to not make it this sort of white color but to really make it uh, this this yellow color it's still bright it doesn't attract sunlight but it can kind of serve as as an emergency beacon um, if if the the boat flips over and um, you know this cooler is left floating in the middle of the sea um, easier to spot for in a in a case of a rescue that was another feature that we only really discovered by talking to people and and sort of uncovering um, this this uh, risk uh, or this kind of worry among people and and it wasn't something that emerged right away but it ended up being one of the most popular uh, features of, of the the cooler that we that we um, delivered to, to these fishermen um, this is kind of a, a separate story that I, I won't go into but it's it's in a way a cautionary tale um, this is a, a cooler that um, was designed to do much the same thing to keep fish fresh at sea but it was really designed um, you know 
in a in a lab somewhere, um, and by you know by material scientists and and by engineers, and it was not necessarily designed with uh, closely with fishermen. So it performs amazingly. You know, it it keeps ice frozen for a really long time, but it is incredibly heavy. Um, it doesn't collapse. It picks up most of the boat, and ultimately, even though this uh, cooler performs extremely well uh, according to sort of the technical specifications, it was never used uh, at sea. It was, the, you know, exactly one of these coolers was produced for a huge amount of money. And today this is this is where it's sitting. And that's really because um, the design was um, separated from from the users who, who were ultimately um, needed to, to enjoy using the cooler. Um, so so that's just a, another little story here. Uh, back to you tomorrow. So yeah. This is so that just kind of, uh, demonstrates how important this testing phase is and how important it, it is to be involving uh, the people that you're designing for throughout the process. And so um, we actually right. spent months so in this phase. We traveled to dozens of towns to across West five provinces in the Philippines, to talking to hundreds of people. And that was not just the fishermen. Um, but as we were talking about How earlier in, in understanding the entire system, we also spoke so to the fish traders, so to the wives good. of the fishermen, to the premium so fish buyers, even to the consumers, and pretty much anyone that had any role to play in the ecosystem of the for example, um, and finally, uh, we ended up solution, with this design, you know, which we manufactured and sold a couple hundred to fisher, uh, fishermen federations system. through a partnership with WWF, okay. as well as to other okay. fishing communities and fish suppliers in Manila. But actually, uh, once this design was finalized, that did not mean that the process okay, ended that. or the design process ended. So, so as you can probably tell um, from this illustration, one of the key right. things so to note be? about so this um, human-centered design approach is that it's not a linear here. process. Uh, it's an iterative process. So you empathize, define, ideate, the prototype, problem. test, and then repeat. Okay. And the more yeah, times that you go through the loops, big, the more big, new things you learn, you fill, discover new opportunities. And essentially, the goal is to constantly be taking in new information, assessing the project and the product. Progress in light the of that information and adjusting the course know, accordingly. So one of the things that we will always start is never being too tight to the original solution, even more effective one comes around. And so in our case, um, right. so you know, you we we were so really we excited about the product that we designed. Um, but as I was describing, we had spent uh, several months so interviewing and observing and learning so from all stakeholders example, throughout the fish supply chains. And through it all, we just kept hearing about and coming uh, across this 40 kilogram styrofoam cooler. It's really omnipresent uh, in fish supply chains and and other um, perishable supply, the, supply chains. And so we really saw an opportunity uh, here to ask more questions about it and understand problem, a little bit more about the context uh, and uh, the potential solutions to, uh, to this Africa, product like, or the, the, uh, the what this product was doing. Yeah, so we began to define a new problem, which is that no one really likes um, styrofoam. It's yeah, cheap and it's light, but it breaks very easily. So it rarely lasts more than two, two months, which is why you can see that um, a, a lot of these are things protected things with duct tape. Exactly. So people are going through all sorts of trouble to protect their styrofoam coolers right. from damage so look at this. because there are no good um, cheap alternatives to styrofoam available. So and so we really um, saw so this as an opportunity and we made use of our uh, this ideating this step again and explored so potential road. solutions to this so problem. Road. So I'll let David tell you a little bit more about okay. what the, other one, the solution, the, side, the solution that we came up with. Support. So uh, post-it notes are, are always great, but um, ultimately our our solution this time around um, came, you know, not from whiteboards, but from actually just spending so much time uh, on the ground in, in Beagle. And, you know, we spent most of our time in Bicol uh, looking at, at fish supply chains. But the other thing that uh, all that province has besides fish is a lot of coconuts. Um, and so we were constantly um, passing piles of coconuts uh, everywhere we went on, on the way to, to fishing grounds. Um, and we started to, to think about, you know, what are these giant uh, piles of, of coconuts uh, there for. Um, and, you know, we were on the hunt for, for alternative materials. 
Um, not only just high performance, but again, um, keeping in mind the whole system, something that would be, uh, you know, affordable and, and low cost as well. And so what better material to, to look at than an agricultural waste um, and a super abundant agricultural waste product at that. Um, and so we, we started to do research, but more than research, we started to look for uh, partners and experts once again. Um, the, the, the theme uh, to so much of our work is just finding the, the amazing uh, partners to, to help us uh, along the way and, and share their, their knowledge and their deep expertise in their own field and to really kind of bring those people and those ideas together. Um, so it turns out uh, it's it's uh, maybe not not super well known, but um, coconut husk fiber has amazing insulation uh, capacity, and um, nobody had had really exploited this. But that was sort of a, a feature that was known about coconut husk fiber. Um, you see this uh, in, in a lot of regions in the Philippines and, and anywhere uh, coconuts are, are produced. Um, there are some sort of low cost, uh, you know, things being done with, with coconut husks. Um, and so this is really what our ideation looked like uh, this time around, was sort of going to these, um, you know, very low tech um, coconut husk processing areas, figuring out sort of what was being done with coconut husks and um, what could we do with them to, to turn it um, from a from a geo net or from a flower pot into a cooler? Um, and so here's one thing that uh, is done with coconut husks. Um, they can be woven into mats and uh, they can be pressed into mattresses. And so, you know, we looked at coconut husk mattresses for long enough and they started looking like uh, panels of, of insulation to us. Um, and, you know, that's just what happens when you are thinking about coolers for, for three straight years. Um, everything starts to look a bit like a cooler. And so, so why not, why not this? Um, and so again, we, we, you know, this was partly our idea, but partly just, uh, you know, amazing partnerships. Um, and and our, our great uh, partner, um, Dr. Arboleda in, uh, of, of Beagle State University and now of Jubokan Enterprises, um, really comes onto the scene here. Um, and so we started working closely with him and with his uh, factory in um, Ginobatan, Ombai, um, and we really just started prototyping. So again, you know, we just dived right in. And so you see that there are every number of different designs that we were trying out, um, different thicknesses, different form factors, different ways of making it waterproof and functional, different ways of collapsing. Um, we tried everything uh, and we made them really quickly uh, it was almost like we would sketch it out on a napkin or on a piece of paper, and together with uh, Dr. Arboleda's team, we would have another prototype uh, to test every day. Um, and so, you know, again, we jumped right into prototyping. We didn't spend months and months uh, in a lab somewhere. Um, so this was on the, the roof of a very accommodated um, guest house in, in Albay, um, doing uh, temperature and performance uh, tests in, in, the, in the hot Philippine sun. Um, so we made, you know, we, we tested uh, how long ice was lasting um, in, in the sun um, with different uh, densities and thicknesses. And of course, we were always comparing it against this control uh, styrofoam cooler on the right. And, um, you know, it's one thing to put it uh, on the roof of a hotel and we were getting some, some encouraging sort of early performance feedback, but um, as we always try to do, we got uh, these products into our uh, customers' hands as soon as possible. And, um, you know, uh, something that we always uh, it's something that takes a bit of practice, but is super important, is to get customers using and, and testing the products sooner rather than later, even a bit before you feel like maybe the product is totally ready for, for prime time for, for, for real world use. Um, and, you know, we've been happily surprised and, and gratified that we've always found um, customers or co-creators or co-designers who were willing to kind of test these, these prototypes early and give us their honest feedback. There's no excuse for us, no? so we have to be prepared. So uh, this, is a, um, this is a this is a fish farming operation. We're really using lots of styrofoam coolers to transfer um, their their catch from uh, these 
fish farms up to Manila and um, who are, are now using uh, several dozen uh, Fortuna coconut coolers um, in their supply chains. I can tell you it did not go super smoothly the first time around and um, I was happy to volunteer tomorrow to sort of uh, deal with what happens when your coolers start to leak, uh, which is not a feature that we necessarily intended, but um, you know, the, the farmers uh, were super understanding and, and jumped right into kind of figuring out how to solve that problem. And, you know, by, I think by, by really extending um, that, that sort of constructive uh, olive, olive branch to them and, and, you know, really uh, bringing them along for the ride, they've become, you know, some of our most uh, enthusiastic early backers and, and have really helped us kind of continue to improve uh, the, the product uh, sooner rather than later. Um, so, so this is another uh, early customer in, in Manila. Um, you can tell that the, the product is getting better and better um, in, in each picture. Um, and this is, this is Fishta, a, a big um, fish distributor, who's also an early pilot customer and, and super enthusiastic uh, backer of, of the idea and, and helping us kind of evangelize um, everywhere we go. Um, and again, you know, we, we tested uh, each, each prototype we made um, this is showing a, a feature that is super important to us, which is, again, making it collapsible. Um, and so you, it makes it super easy to, to distribute and it, it actually uh, saves money on the return trip, which a lot of these customers kind of emphasize to us that half the time um, they are what they say, shipping air. You know, every time they, they send their coolers back, um, they're, they're completely empty. And so if we can collapse uh, the coolers, we can save a lot of money on, on return shipping. Again, this is a, a feature that came straight from the users and wasn't necessarily obvious to us going in, but um, is ultimately gonna be one of our most important uh, features as we, as, really, as we really scale up and, and make larger sales. Um, and just a, a final word about, um, you know, in, in the spirit of, of the, the circularity-ness, of, uh, of, of this process, um, sort of returning to, to the empathize um, uh, step here. We've always empathized that we've really figured out how to make a great product. And it's really by learning from um, those those really skilled manufacturers who, you know, often get ignored in this process. Um, it's it's not always the the engineers um, in, in the labs who come up with the the brilliant insights. Um, each one of these folks uh, at the factory um, have have helped us make a, an amazing product and one that they're super excited to work on. And it also just makes for a stronger manufacturing relationship as well. So um, that's that's I wouldn't say the the end of. Our uh, but it is kind of the story of how, how we got started, how we ended up in the Philippines and, and how we've developed a, a couple of products that are already on the market and um, in customers' hands and getting feedback and, and scaling up. Um, and so, so I think I, uh, we, will, we will leave it there. Um, but uh, tomorrow, is there, is there anything else you wanted to add or, or should we um, turn, turn, it, turn it back over to Dr. CP and the team? Yeah, I think we should open it up for questions. Um, you know, the latter part of the story is how we built the nutshell cooler, which is the name that you've seen in the uh, um, in the poster, um, which is the the cooler that we, which is a, a consumer cool thing you know we really wanted to share the or in this thinking process um and open it up for questions. great story david and Tamara. i am walking us through the steps um uh, from our next speaker from jojo flores can you give us some idea of the timeline how much time did you spend so on and so forth. I know it's a circular iterative process, but what's the, at least for, for how much time did you allocate per step? I mean, 
during the presentation, we really jumped into prototyping and testing very, very on. So you might have seen from some of the um, early photos that actually we started building prototypes even before we came to the Philippines for the first time. So, so a lot of our first stage here in California, replicas back at the University of the Boat uh, to sort of test the way that Hello. a fisherman might feel moving around such a small space. Hello. Um, yeah. <laughs> or making Hello, some guys. foam core tuna to sort of feel, yeah, uh, get a better uh, nice. idea of the size. Yeah, so it really was pretty much from day one. Um, but of course, we, we weren't able to test directly with the communities from day one because we we were not there physically. So we did come up with these creative ways to do that from, you know, remotely. But as soon as we had an opportunity, it really, the, the biggest jump in our design happened once we were on the ground um, building prototypes uh, and testing them directly with the fishing communities. But, All right. Uh, but, but I think uh, based on the no, no, file that, that we gave out to the so, first, so we are now actually in, from the personal product, we it was with, with the, the, the so, fisher folk and really uh, understand the problem. Is that correct? Like yeah, that's right. Here. So after we had spent uh, a few months on so, uh, at the unit and, and understanding this new ecosystem that we weren't so familiar with. Um, two, two of our partners went to the Philippines for a couple of weeks and spent some time in the community. Even at that stage, we, br we brought some what we call conversational prototypes, which are, you know, very early on, sometimes even just sketches or, or um, yeah, just a very early prototype. To start that process, we brought back a lot of information from that trip. Um, uh, continues to do a lot of iterations and, and then went back to the Philippines for the about three months uh, the second okay. time along. So related to that, process. David and Tamara, so part uh, is defining, what no? the, the most important so step that leads to me in design thinking we, is the first step, um, which is the empathy aspect. Solve, and I wanted to ask you directly, how important is that step of, of really process, no? understanding the problem and, and actually putting the, putting yourselves in the shoes of those who will be using that product later on in terms of building that compassion? I mean, you're several thousand miles away right? from home, so, right? But but um, you did develop that, that, that compassion to, um, to be able to just move forward and it, even with the the, the bumps the uh, along the way also, you you continued to persist and develop that product for these people that you have uh, uh, okay, there's a become here. friends with okay. eventually. I wouldn't even say eventually it happened uh, it Did happened uh, about as soon as we showed up to, to <laughs> okay. Lubang the, the first the first day um, but would you no, say that's uh, uh, an important aspect really uh, of knowing uh, your customers uh, and uh, now you're not just doing this uh, project uh, for environmental purposes or even really for economic purposes but really it's solving a problem okay yeah uh, dr cp i i, I completely uh, agree that um, empathy is is really the cornerstone of, of design thinking and and really of just about any um good and impactful and you know scalable uh, product or okay, solution you, um, on the market um, today so um yeah i mean i think we we always knew that that uh, we needed to to solve a, a real problem and the people who were going to tell us um, what that problem is uh, were you know the people themselves we couldn't just uh, sort of dream up back at Stanford you know hypothetically what is what is the problem and, and what is going to be the solution we had to we had to you know get to know the the people and and have them kind of direct each uh, each step of of the process to, to make sure we were we were on the right track and we were doing it together I mean, so, initially, um, initially you yeah. were doing this for your class to get a good grade in class yeah, correct that... but uh, you've right. since graduated uh, from Stanford and yet you're still here and and doing the, the right, company. Guys. Yeah, you know, this was, this so so the, I trace that back to that back, empathy part. Go down. I I think totally it was it was a class project to right. begin with, we and uh, we 
you know, right. we, so that's we probably, when we went into it, thought that by the end of the uh, semester, okay. it was so going to be over. Cool, but but uh, we developed such a cool good relationship with the community and we really got to understand cool exactly what, so what the situation cool was so and sort of realize that really we, we had an opportunity the, um, to create an impactful solution together with him. And, and so once you sort of have that that, kind of that hook, the, it's really hard <laughs> to just turn around and be like, you know, this is just a class project. Actually, it wasn't. It was real people that we were helping a real solution with. Right. Real so problem. I hope that's clear. Now, so that's next great. slide, please. Harvey. And, um, and so and fast then, forward to four years since process, you started this are, project. So we are, the company we is uh, company, now has two products way, that you want to uh, understanding commercialize. In, in fact, the coolers might so not just uh, be for fisher folk anymore, but uh, for general purpose, and, just and because it's a, a good fit in terms of replacing a product so that's, that's uh, the, not environment friendly, it's that. not durable. Now, once it does the job, but the uh, other than that, and it's cheap. Other than design, that, you have all these disadvantages the with using styrofoam. Right? Um, yeah, you, when we were walking around this, with our cooler, we got a lot of interest from people who just wanted one for personal you use. You know, it was it definitely solves a lot of um, problems in in the supply chain with the durability uh, aspect of um, the styrofoam cooler, but it's also just an exciting product with an exciting with an exciting story behind it and a new material that resonates so a lot with people, so this is where the theme um, which is why we've, so we've created this new line of products that, that is a, a consumer. That is where the theme yeah. would generate lots Perfect. of ideas. Thanks, Not one idea, At this point, I'd like to bring in our first reactor, uh, and she is no less than the really president of one of the biggest state universities in to sell, uh, uh, Region 4, uh, or Region 3, rather. Dr. Cecilia right. Gascon so is the president is, um, of Bulacan Harvey. State University, so I did. So and so we wanted to hear process. your comments so and insights know, on the presentation to, made by our two friends, so David and Tamara. Good morning, so to say, Thank you. President Gascon. Good morning, so we good morning just, everyone. We cannot really do this in the uh, Navigato. So what happens is that you will be asked to really put down your Sorry, ma'am, may so mahina yung audio so, ninyo. Sa Can you na, increase the uh, or okay. maybe Is it okay now? Think, no? so, it's a little bit, but yes, you know, we'll, we'll so, yes. Next week, next Thursday, so once again, good morning. You'll be able to define our how might be statements uh, based on the business uh, idea Mara. that we are so, of course, looking like at uh, at that. that, that so. So we go for a JSON. What are the potential solutions? So not only the how much we take meant, but the potential solutions. Are Next slide, please. RB. So when we're done with the JSON, so there are plenty of ideas floating around, going around. The thing is that we need to select among ourselves. No? What is the best idea that we can set no, or we can use so that we will be able to, for example, um, develop a prototype? So that is, we go back to the, I don't know, we go back to the first uh, three circles. No? So desirability, so technical feasibility, and also the business viability. So as we do that, the digestion process, we always refer back to... Sorry, President, President Gascon, we don't want to miss anything that you will be mentioning. You have to... Can you place your laptop maybe closer? Yes, please. Thank you. 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 Thank Okay. Is it okay now? Yes, it's uh, louder. Help us, no? okay. Go ahead. Yeah, so these um, are the key takeaways. So I would like to start. Some various ideas. There is no limit. Uh, the first one. You can so this list is, them down. Uh, Even the wild because, ideas. Um, this, but there is you a try to narrow it. No? Yeah, narrow. Narrow down your ideas. Economy, and society. How to narrow down that? 
In terms of going back to those three aspects again, uh, technical feasibility, kaya ba, baka sa pagtok sa buwan, uh, baka ang technology you need to develop is gonna be 20, 30 years from, from now pa mag-exist. No? So timing is everything. So we want to capitalize on how this can be implemented very soon. Uh, technical aspect, no? so business. So, when we say business, so, when you have this product now, can, can I, uh, how many people are you going to use potentially? You know, millions of people, millions of Filipinos. So, you always go back to that. And then, when you're convinced now, with crossing your, your I don't know, crossing those checklists you have, it's time for you if you're convinced. You and yourself would have to say to yourself, I think we're ready to do the understanding of the based on this from whom design decision that we have in terms of the so idea. That I really admire you so guys for you know you, know, you build uh, the prototype. Having so it's even really going to the to the community and like experiencing their lives nice. and from but there others, like, they we're able to, to think of a uh, product stage, that will not you know, only help this community but also. Uh, useful to, to the other members of like the society. The of future. course, number three, so, so this is a solution-based approach to solving right. problems. So, delivery. you know, you uh, highlight the importance of searching now, for so solutions. So, right? first, so, uh, some like the concern design, is only for the future the, costs. So, the concern uh, for to, in order to maintain so, the, of course, the products, no? So the, the freshness of the fish, but eventually you're also solving so the, the concern of how our coconut farmers. Uh, so here they have the alternative like livelihood. Like, I am expecting the coconut farmers will also have the, the alternative livelihood no, so because of your you know, uh, because of your brand. Okay. Of, uh, so and then of course in the so practical yeah, social design, innovation. So, so the idea is finesse. created yeah, with the goal of extending and you strengthening also, uh, civil society to meet yeah, social so needs in a better way be than the existing solutions in resolving you know, uh, uh, plastic pollution. Okay, so these are the key uh, takeaways uh, and I would like to uh, like that, right? go to my so questions those are part of the design because I know that there are a lot of people uh, maybe uh, interested to ask questions. So I will be going straight to my questions. So those are my uh, key takeaways uh, again for sustainable, this is totally designed, uh, right? so, solution based approach to solving problems so story, and practical social innovations. Okay, so um, right, if so, I may, uh, in the university, we okay. are also having this technology uh, ne business slide, incubation. And one of my questions is related so the, to that. But I, I will start here, with my one, first question. Uh, and I frame that, this question from this uh, the even, uh, UN Sustainable with, Development Goals, paper, the themes of the UN no, Sustainable so Development Goals. If okay, be into so service, first is on the, the people. Plan, so my question is, how, uh, how do you collaborate you with example, uh, uh, the team? So how, how did you collaboratively uh, build the teams uh, for uh, from, the from the ground, from the community, considering that you are a uh, foreigner? So how are you going? So how, how did like you this. make that a uh, collaboration so, and build uh, a team paper, on the ground yeah, so and sure develop this uh, talent ecosystem? They have internal design thinking uh, experts, no? so they hire people. Na how how can they? Maybe we can uh, we we can. Uh, have all your questions. I'm also writing them down, and then we'll uh, state it in the matter to answer. Okay, with doing prototype, we need to. You can complete your uh, your set of questions first. Okay. So that's my question for uh, for the people. Uh, my question for uh, U.S. Army, Marines, so when they Navy, when they attack, partnership is. Well, of course, so, I am, I am before, very much interested in the partnership. So, what are the uh, possible the collaborations uh, on social innovation so programs? They do the same thing. Uh, uh, so, they develop the Philippine higher kind of education solutions engage with uh, so that before they attack, uh, Stanford they University. See utilizing uh, the design uh, thinking uh, methodology. Uh, so, well, I'm not sure whether you are in the position to ask this question. Again, I, I would no? like to ask so, you know, possible the collaboration. A social innovation program where right. the university so, can prototype web mobile app so 
two together. All right. So you know, okay. so and for my people, last we don't even just need to go to Kuala you know, Lumpur for coding data. Uh, I have no? still have no, three more. No, they need to coding. So what um, people do usually? This is on the face and uh, even justice. Okay. Uh, they have um, so very currently, good, uh, although your your site you is in uh, is so in Bihol. So, uh, but my question is related to this, but currently the, the Dava region is the largest producing province in the country. So, how can this project, okay, the, 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 the product that you develop, be an instrument in order to promote? And uh, when everything is covered already, in like, this ah, I got portion covered. of uh, our country, I got everything covered so do you see any any relevance here, of uh, this, this project back, in this, forward, uh, as uh, considering this, it close. as an instrument so in to, say, to you got promote covered, no? so uh, peace in that. that particular so that's that's your storyboard uh, that, uh, that's your prototype. Uh, so that's example, right. Excellent so questions, Dr. Gascon. I'm afraid to ask uh, your other questions because these are already three tough questions for David and Tamara to answer. Um, although our Q&A would still be after our next reactor, I, I hate to, to miss your reaction to the three questions of President Gascon. So we'll go through it right now very quickly. The first one, how did you... Uh, how are you able to collaborate with tests. everybody that needs so, uh, to be part of that project on the ground? Yeah, I can, I, I can answer that quickly. So we, um, from the beginning through the program at Stanford, were partnered with an NGO in the Philippines called Blair. And so actually it was through that partnership uh, that we started to develop our local network. Uh, as well as Germany through connections like Dr. CP. Uh, they, <laughs> um, and it, actually we found that there was really an incredibly supportive uh, ecosystem uh, in the Philippines uh, of you know, people uh, interested in social uh, entrepreneurship they, and test, in developing out, environmental solutions. So we were lucky to partner uh, guys, with Rare as well as with WWF, with Tambuyo, the other local organizations that are doing really great work with fishermen and farmers as well as obviously with um, our manufacturing partners. So that was really a, a stroke of luck, um, just re reaching out to Dr. Justin Arboleda. But uh, generally, we just found that by being in the country, our network continued to grow the more that we shared our story with others and the more that we had people on board. It was sort of what David was saying earlier about finding the people with the right expertise and sort of recruiting them to, to share this idea and this vision with us. Uh, and it was through that that we continued to grow our, our team group, and really, and um, you know, find also, the communities that we would partner with and find the people who and were willing to be early testers and really develop uh, that entire once network. Once all inputs are there... And, and so, so by now, Tamara, you would have noticed that in the Philippines, now, everyone seems that, to know so everyone or that if you need something, somebody knows somebody who can do that. And that it's, it's perfect that you were able to take advantage of that informal it's a small network. network. It's not, it's not the, yeah, it really, yeah. we've really found an incredible network in the Philippines. Okay, next question. Phone, no? Expanding no. this network no. and partnering no. with no. state no. universities, no. for example, Biko no. State no. University, no. are there no. uh, avenues no. where we can partner no. with no. universities? Yeah, absolutely. Um, I, I think there's there's a handful of, of uh, sort of publicly available tools and toolkits that have been sort of uh, uh, housed at the Stanford Design School, but are really all about kind of sharing the structure of running everything from a, a short workshop to a, an entire sort of class or class module around design thinking. Um, and the design school is at, the, at Stanford is always looking for international partnerships as, as well and, and really sees it as their mission to kind of help spread uh, the, the, the sort of gospel of, of design thinking. So um, there's there's definitely lots of, of uh, opportunities for, for partnerships with the Stanford D School and 
um, and so and Tamara and I are have, have have been really lucky to teach some design thinking workshops in the past. In fact, this was the longest we've pretty much ever spoken at one time before. Usually, it's it's much more interactive and, and much more of a workshop. So, um, yeah, the there's there's uh, lots of opportunities for, for partnerships there. I think. Perfect. Yeah. So, President Gascon, uh, in the past year, the uh, David and Tamara ha have uh, taught design thinking workshops in Ateneo. I did one workshop with uh, both of them for the Department of Foreign Affairs Systems Thinking and Design Thinking. If this is something that you need, uh, we are developing a workshop along those lines through the iris and so it's just a matter of uh, contacting dr Juanillo if you need this kind of yeah, yeah thank you very much actually um we, we are in partnership with um, singapore polytechnic and we are also uh, training our students in this design thinking uh, approach so but of course uh we are we will be very glad if stanford university who david and tamara would have partnership with the university so this is something uh, a parochial a parochial concern because i would like the of course the, the vision of the bulacan state university is to become a let's generate uh, okay. innovation about, uh, is very uh, much here, important no? as we would like so to you know train our graduates as well to maybe innovate and he's gonna, she's gonna, like, uh, solve also societal problems so i think yeah, this is know, very if, uh, that's perfect. That's perfect. One last question from Dr. Gascon on peace and justice. How do you see your product uh, to be uh, to evolve into like an instrument that will promote peace and justice? I mean, it's uh, very far into the future, but is this a consideration as well? Because we know for a fact that your products also look at the environmental aspect of things and social and not and just the uh, financial and economics. One million products of this. Yeah, absolutely. Um, you know, I, I, we, we do always try to be to be modest. Um, and, and so I, I won't say that, um, you know, we're, we're solving any any uh, peace and justice problems uh, just just yet. But um, there is amazing opportunities for uh, development in very rural areas, uh, which do not often get uh, you know, significant you investments um, in, into them. Um, we've been really so humbled and uh, privileged to work with Dr. Arboleda, um, who has really created um, from from very little uh, a thriving um, economic so, ecosystem based so in a, in rural Albay state. And I think um, you know, it's it's not just uh, using the the coconut husk, but really finding you know value added uh, products and and really working to recruit a lot of people from the local community. Uh, to be involved in in that great work, and we really see that as as a model for for how we will expand into new supply chains and new producer relationships. Um, and it would be amazing. I've I've done a, a trip to to Davao and, and met several um, coconut producers and coconut husk producers uh, in that region. Um, and it's a very natural place for us to expand. And I think there's there's huge opportunities for for rural economic development um, uh, if if we can make that work so it's it's uh it's definitely um a, a lofty goal but i think uh a, a goal that we very much uh share let's reach out to the state universities in the davao area that would be probably the easiest step yeah fantastic perfect thank you president gascon at this point let's move on to our next reactor dr dran earl Juanico is professor of applied physics in tip he represents the leadership of tip one of the uh, rising stars in the hei ecosystem rem the floor is yours for your comments Okay, this is uh, going to be uh, brief. So, um, uh, entrepreneurial spirit is more likely a, a talent than a learned skill. But some cultures and educational systems somewhat encourage this more than others. For instance, the mindset towards uh, risk taking and problem solving. And like some institutions, like probably Stanford, right? also have deeper research, pockets right? than others. <laughs> so, but then uh, here at the Technological Institute of the Philippines, uh, the student body and the faculty 
uh, have been immersed for probably for the last five years in the concept of real world of problem solving and its connection with entrepreneurship as well as commercialization. Now, in the 2018 Winter Olympics, 93 out of 2,952 athletes accounted for 208 of the 487 medals to be won. Okay, to be short, that is equivalent to just about 13% probability of any Olympic athlete to take, uh, athlete to take home medals. But the chances of success among startups are less. I'm sure. <laughs> Nevertheless, to the natural entrepreneur, the pursuit is always worth the risk, just as the Olympic medal is worth the effort to a natural athlete. Now, the story that you shared with us this morning uh, behind Fortuna Pools, that was very inspiring because it somehow took us to the journey uh, uh, how you uh, came up from from you know, just an idea to a tangible product. And and uh, I guess my, my reaction to that uh, is, is something that we would like to emulate as well here at, uh, at the uh, Technological Institute of the Philippines. We are also working on several projects. Like we had an experience back in 2016. Uh, we also went to a community. Uh, it's it's uh, a fishing community as well, but in, in the lake, so it's a, it's a, it's a, so a lake fishing okay. community, and then we also uh, tried to uh, so connect with the community and then came up with a solution to so the okay. problem that hopefully would have helped them as well in um, um, increasing the profitability of their fishing business. Now, uh, with regard to the, to the technology that you uh, presented okay. earlier about Fortuna so Pools, um, well, I realize that it, it's it's a technology inspired by the uh, prospect of substituting a plastic component uh, to be, be, be more sustainable. And I guess what uh, you came up with is something that's also abundant uh, in, in the Philippines, so the coconut choir or, or husk. Um, so I, I'm just curious. Uh, uh, if if it, it was also it was also thought uh, during the ideation or maybe during the uh, prototyping yeah. uh, process that you underwent, because when plastic was discovered and eventually developed by Dupont and uh, Dow Chemical, uh, it took decades to realize that plastics were uh, not totally good for the environment. So I mean, the discovery of the, the phenomenon of microplastics and uh, plastic pollution. Uh, did not really uh, Guys, become, uh, uh, I, I should say, popular uh, right. uh, so until recently. Who's the so, do you uh, foresee the who's the any the environmental university? repercussions as well of the right. so, potentially yeah, massive use of coconut husk? I mean, if your product really takes off right. and then people would so want to the, buy it, then that would mean there will be more. Um, there would be more. Um, uh, production to turn the coconut husk into the material for your rollers. So you and we let's try to answer that first. Uh, yes. So <laughs> that's actually my ailing question now. <laughs> okay, let's try to answer that. David? It's a fantastic question. Um, and yeah, I, I, uh, it's, it's a, it would be a, a nice problem for, for us to have, but um, something that as a social enterprise, we do take very seriously is um, thinking long term and, and sort of playing out, you know, what, what do those scenarios look like? And, um, you know, we are doing uh, manufacturing and that does have, it's not all just uh, purely uh, positive um, impacts. There, there are um, some, some negative impacts. And so um, something that, that is really important to us is to build in from, you know, day one, uh, really good environmental safeguards um, and really, really um, careful monitoring and evaluation programs so that as a first, First instance, yeah. we actually are capturing that Students data, and we actually know, you know, what what are those so impacts that, this, that we're responsible for, and and how can we build in a, a mitigation system so that um, we can scale without the, creating um, new problems of our own. We right. we did, so, you know, choose um, yeah. agricultural yeah. waste yeah. as our yeah. input for like well, very intentionally, um, and so we are tapping into that. a resource 
that is super, super abundant, um, not just in the Philippines, but in, in many places uh, across the tropics. And so, um, you know, we feel like we're starting from, from, a, from a, 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 a sort of a pretty good place, a place that we're pretty confident in, which is, you know, that if, if coconut husks are, are not used, they are uh, quite literally burned as, as waste. Um, and so already we kind of start from a good place and we have that kind of positive impact built in. Um, and we've sort of done the, the calculations to see, you know, at what scale would, would, uh, would, would it take for us to be actually incentivizing additional coconut production. Um, and that scale uh, is, you know, as, as a startup, it's within our ambition, um, but it is absolutely massive. Um, you know, 15 billion coconuts are produced in the Philippines alone every year. Um, about 9 billion coconuts are waste. Um, and so we have a lot, a lot of room to, to grow before we um, exhaust that, that sort of waste stream as, as our, our inputs. But it, it definitely is on our radar. And, and thanks That's for great. It's actually the same question from uh, one of our, uh, uh, the, one of the people in the audience, Al Marvillota, was asking, how do you see scaling up? And uh, how, how do you see this scaling up? And uh, Rem pointed out, Okay, are you also tracking the potential problems in terms of supply? I don't think there'd be a, an issue with pollution because these are all natural products, but uh, it's good that you're tracking everything uh, along the way. Uh, so, so the question of Elmar is, uh, how do you see this scaling? Yeah, um, you know, we are lucky to to have received a, a a grant award recently from the un development program to to really help us scale into into new um, supply chains um it's it's why you know i was i was already thinking about davao uh, recently um going back to to the to the former question so um, we, we are really excited to tap into some new uh, production sites and we have sort of all the demand that, that we can ha handle right now and it's really about uh, getting production up to scale to, to meet that to meet that demand um, so so we are uh, hoping to, to bring a second um, production supply chain online um, later in 2021 and we've sort of identified our expansion markets uh, where, where we go um, after after that but it's it's really coming back to, to partnerships um you know we are, are you're sort of looking at at the, the core team of, of fortuna right now um, we're, we're a pretty lean team and the success we've had has been all about finding amazing partners so part of the opportunity is you know finding where where the market conditions are best but we are also super careful and deliberate to expand where we have great partners in place so i, I just a, a, maybe a little pitch uh for, for the audience um, we're talking to some pretty amazing folks here so um uh we're, we're always eager to, to meet uh, partners working in in this or adjacent uh, spaces across the philippines so feel free to if, if this sparks any ideas to send um, great potential partners our way as well perfect okay back to you just one last question for david and tamara uh, how far do you think, from your experience, uh, how far does patent protection enhance the profitability of your idea? Uh, I'm really sorry, it's already penetrating. It's uh, an, another uh, quite a good question, and um, yeah, maybe you have a, a second a, a second career as as an investor. <laughs> uh, we, we do answer. We, yeah, this is something we we've, we've thought a lot about. Um, you know, we, we think that part of what we're doing is patentable, but, um, you know, part of, of what we're doing is, is really all about execution and, and just, you know, getting momentum up and, and really getting out in front of, of any potential competitors or, or knockoffs or so forth. We're targeting an absolutely massive uh, market opportunity here. And so the, the challenge, um, you know, part of it is, has been developing this sort of recipe book for creating great insulation out of this, this product. and. Um, um, I think we, right, we will Bye, probably everyone. pursue a patent on a very much, specific guys. part of that process. Thank you. Thank but I think so actually the, the greater well, value lies guys. in um, right. you know the, the extensive okay, uh, relationships, Bye. supply Bye. relationships Bye. that we've Bye. built Bye. and also the brand and story that Bye. we're, we're Bye. building, which is you know not something that's Thank patentable, you. but ultimately something that I think is, is super Bye. valuable um, Bye. As, Bye. in terms of sort of what, what, is, what it's our company represent. So I think, yeah, it's not just about the, the patent IP, but it's it's really about executing and and um, yeah, just building on this momentum and, and growing uh, 
taking advantage of, of the opportunities that we have here. Thank you. That was very encouraging. Great question, Reb. No, that's uh, something that uh, probably all inventors and startup owners uh, will face, whether to have it patented or uh, go straight to the market. I guess what David is saying is that, uh, yes, patenting might be somewhere along the way later on, but uh, you can combat this by being first in the market, by building your network right away. If this catches on, there'd be other people making co coconut husk coolers, right? But if you are first to the market and you've already built your supply chain and everything, then it's pretty far, far from uh, being caught up by, by other competitors, if you may. And if they do, then even perfect because we now start to replace at a massive scale something that's uh, not sustainable. Great. <laughs> Thank you for that. <laughs> All right. Anything else, Rem? I'm good. Thank All you. All right. Thanks very much. Okay, we have a few minutes left, and I want to go through some of the questions from our audience, which are, I, I was reading them, they were really good and difficult to answer. Okay. Uh, from uh, Rosa Villarde, with your project's contribution, how will it be performed at the different levels of management, especially at the local level? I guess she is uh, talking about, um, I guess, scaling as well. How, how do you scale this? And um, well, understanding the role of civil society and the farmer sector in uh, the development of the product, I guess, other than uh, getting their feedback on the material and the product itself. Do you see any other contribution from the civil society? Maybe in the marketing of the product or, I mean, or lending their story to uh, the product so that people are more enlightened? I think definitely sharing the story of our suppliers is something that we're exciting we're excited about as we built this brand. But I think it, it comes down also to what David was talking about earlier in terms of the um, the supply networks that we've built um, with the farming communities and with the manufacturers. So it's it really comes down to to those partnerships and and having the farmers really involved in the process, you know, making it again goes back also to the monitoring and evaluation program really having uh, insights into where the coconut husks that we're getting are coming from, how mm -hmm. the, you know, our collaborations with the farmers that we're sourcing from and with the entire supply network. Um, and yeah, continuing sort of that same process of being really transparent and really connected to, to those suppliers as we continue to scale. Okay, and there are very practical questions here that's related to uh, the supply chain and raw materials from Marisa and from Engineer Ramos. First question is, at this point in time, how much does a coconut husk cooler cost? Maybe to produce or if you have a retail uh, price already for, for a cooler or a ballpark figure? Yeah, it is. Um, you know, when when you're talking about packaging, uh, the packaging market, it's all about scale. Um, and so scale is, is not a luxury that we have quite yet. So our production costs are are still, um, still you know, quite yeah. a bit higher than 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 uh, styrofoam is. Um, but, but what would we, be the price point that, that you would want to achieve at some point? I think getting getting to about um, 800 or a thousand pesos uh, would be kind of our, our target uh, on, on the retail market. It's still more expensive than a styro box, but it lasts many times longer. So it's, it's, it feels about right in terms of the investment. Um, it's, it's manageable for, for folks um, and, and will pay itself off uh, many times over, over the last. How much does a styrofoam box of the same size cost? Would it be? About, um, 350 or 400 pesos. Okay, so uh, if you, you can, can reuse it and last uh, twice as long as you, your styrofoam box, then you have a better deal already. 
exactly. Okay, perfect. And is and there a is, is there a plan to to sell the coolers not just to Fisher folk but also commercially maybe in the states? Absolutely, we we get interest um, inbound interest uh, all the time from from an amazing different array of of uh, sectors and geographies, um, and so, you know, uh, actually getting back to to Sir Reb's point about um, making sure that we're you know tracking our impact, um, there is definitely a different impact if we're um, you know selling huge volumes that are produced in the Philippines and sold um, abroad, and so uh, we're we're also exploring you know production in different sites and production using the same techniques but with different materials and so forth. Um, but uh, the, the the short answer is, um, you know, yes, styrofoam in insulated packaging is used in a huge array of different uh, industries and, and business supply chains. And pretty much um, any one of those uh, supply chains is a good candidate for for Fortuna Cools to, to target and go after. Perfect. And there are a few questions here from Jan and I say yes. Uh, and they really wanted to know about the sustainability of uh, the, the product. You already mentioned that uh, currently we are using a waste uh, material from the coconut industry and therefore sustainability wise, we are not competing against uh, any other use uh, at this particular point in time. If uh, there are other uses that for sure this is uh, providing more value than other uses, for example, transforming it into charcoal and uh, other products. Um, but do you see any other sustainability issues beyond uh, sourcing your raw materials? Yeah, I think your, your point is uh, exactly right about um the opportunities here with with reusing uh you know a, a waste product that was going to be burned so we definitely see a, a positive impact there i think a lot about is the end of life of our product so we also consider that um the coconut husk fiber can be repurposed even after it's gone into our cooler so that's also a really exciting opportunity there as well um i saw in the comments someone mentioning it can be turned into activated carbon yes from the first one yes Oh, right. Correct. It can also be made into compost or even um, repurposed to make um, uh, like uh, planters. So there's there's a lot of opportunities there, and that's always um, gone into our design process to to consider the the way that we would dispose of this. Um, so that's another one, and then there's also a weight consideration. So um, you know we we've made the cooler collapsible so that we can minimize the transportation volume um, and that way uh, reduce our transportation impact, but uh, it is slightly heavier than a styrofoam cooler. So that's something to consider as well. And uh, from what you mentioned, Tamara, there's a little bit more R&D that can be done to even optimize the product and maybe even convert it into other uh, related products in the future. And there are you guys all with uh, local researchers to further the design process and uh, if and I hope uh, you are because this is probably just the start of uh, that coconut cooler idea and can expand to other products later on yeah I, yeah, I guess one, the problem of uh, making it lightweight that already to itself that, that can be a research <laughs> question that we try and <laughs> oh, you're in physics, so you should have some ideas already. Yeah, like how to inject more air into the matrix. Maybe I guess that's the idea there. <laughs> but yeah, yeah, I think R&D will be very, uh, very much worth it. You know? It's definitely a huge, yeah, a, a huge part of our work moving forward. Um, there's, you know, thinking about uh, ways to waterproof it, thinking about ways to make it lighter, make it more insulative. There's a, a ton of opportunities there. And I'm always super happy to collaborate. That's sort of going back to the plug that David was putting uh, yeah. in there. We're yeah. always looking for, for partners. We can get help in R&D and pretty much any other department that you can think of as well. <laughs> <laughs> That's great. And before I let you go, guys, oh, thank, thanks, Rep, by the way. Uh, 
for your comments. Oh, welcome, and I hope you're friend. also open to collaborations. Indeed, right? indeed. <laughs> I saw a question earlier from the chat box. They, they really wanted to know, David and Tamara, what is, what is your motivation and what keeps you going uh, in pursuing this project? I mean, in just a couple of sentences uh, for each, what drives you to, to do this? And we can start with Tamara. I, I can see David <laughs> still thinking. Um, yeah, ahead. I mean, I think, I think it goes back to what we were talking about earlier in terms of, you know, I, I think from day one, we were received with open arms by the fishing communities. Um, they shared so much of their time and their expertise with us, and we always wanted to give that to give back, and not just with the communities, but what I was mentioning also earlier about the support network that we got in the Philippines, even from the first time that we were there, and the entire yeah, just like um, innovators ecosystem of people who really care deeply about the fishing and farming communities and about seeing a positive impact there. And just personally seeing and truly believing in the impact that our products can have, I think that's that's um, what what motivates me. Thanks, Tamara. David, you wanted to add anything? I would. I would only just add. I it, that, those are those are huge motivators for me. And the only one I would add is uh, I, I do really believe in the social entrepreneurship model and um, love the idea of uh, not just you know pursuing development through charity and through aid, but actually um, finding really sustainable models uh, that, that lead to development in places that are often uh, overlooked by, by traditional investment opportunities. So um, absolutely love the, the idea of, of really creating a, a super you know, cool technology and, and a really um, interesting product in, in rural parts of, of the Philippines and, and all over the world. And I, I'm super inspired to, to help to do that and, and also just continually inspired by the the brilliance of, of our partners in, in all of these different areas who, you know, maybe didn't, uh, weren't lucky enough to, to go to Stanford, but are still, you know, just as, as, as uh, smart and, and um, innovative and, and are really helping us to, to create a really sustainable model for development. So that's what I would add. That's great. I mean, you guys, the, the work that you've done over the, the last four years or so are truly, uh, inspiring and uh, if I were the president of the Philippines I would have conferred you dual citizenship already for just for the work and the effort that you have done thanks guys oh what a, what an honor thank you so much <laughs> all right there are a few Please. more questions in the chat box and the Q&A uh, box if you can stay on David and Tamara to answer those questions that would be great Anything else? Yeah. No, uh, uh, thank you so much, uh, Dr. CP, and, and to, bo to both uh, the, the, the discussants. Um, really appreciate the, the comments and, and the opportunity to, to present to you all. Hope, hope to stay in touch. That's great. Thank you, guys. OK, let's move on to our next, uh, the next portion of our webinar. Uh, but David and Tamara, I know it's uh, getting late there, but uh, I hope you can still stay on. Who would have imagined that in, right at the heart, at the center of Silicon Valley, where much of the innovation that we are seeing up to today you know, come from, is a, an institution in the Silicon Valley that is run by a Filipino. You know? Probably not many of you know that the Plug and Play Innovation Center is co-founded by our next speaker, Jose Avelino Flores or Jojo Flores. And it would be great, Jojo, to hear your insights about innovation. What are our prospects as a country in terms of developing our own Silicon Valley model? And in general, your experience on uh, innovation and the startup community. So without much further ado, let's hear uh, our next speaker to talk about getting your product make market sense, uh, the plug and play experience. I present to you, Jojo Flores. Good morning. Thank you very much, CP, for that very warm welcome. I look forward to our next golf game 
soon. Uh, nice to see some uh, familiar faces here. Nap, Al, Nap, thank you very much for inviting. And uh, I'm really honored to be here this morning and uh, share uh, uh, the story that we have over at Plug and Play. Uh, let me share my screen. Can everybody see it? Not yet. Uh, let's see. Wala pa. Is, is it showing in your screen? Your presentation? Hold on. Hold on, sorry. Okay, we can see it. Great, great. And then if you can, yes, play it. All right. All right. Again, good morning to everybody. Happy to be here uh, uh, to share our uh, plug and play experience with universities over, over these last years. So <clears throat> our, our story really, really began in this little building that we had uh, that we have uh, along Palo Alto, uh, along University Avenue in Palo Alto. Uh, for those of you who have not been there, it's uh, the uni it's the it's the uh, street that leads into uh, Stanford University. And uh, uh, everybody called this little building of ours, 165 University, the Lucky Building. Uh, I, I guess ex because. Uh, famous startups started there like uh, Google, as you see in the picture here, Logitech, PayPal, and a company called Danger, which was actually uh, the company that uh, Andy Rubin started. Andy eventually became the uh, CEO of Android uh, when uh, Google launched it. But uh, uh, as you see in this picture here, uh, their startup team started in our building and uh, I think they left when they were around 40 or 50 people uh, and they outgrew the space that, that, that we had. But until now, we still keep very close relationships with the folks over there. Uh, but uh, this started in the late 90s, okay? Uh, but it really was the 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 uh, beginning of a uh, story of uh, plug and play. Fast forward to uh, to today. Uh, we've uh, since expanded our operations uh, after 15 years, uh, because we started in 2006, to uh, about 35 cities now in uh, close to uh, 20 countries uh, worldwide. So uh, when I started Plug and Play, I had the startup team of less than 10 people. We were about six, including myself. And now we have uh, actually close to 700 people now uh, in all of these offices around the world. So uh, what is our vision? Our vision is uh, that innovation should be open to anyone, anywhere. We think that uh, uh, something uh, that is invented uh, remains to be an invention if it is not enjoyed and uh, by everyone around the world uh, or a majority of people around the world or uh, or whether it is uh, uh, and our mission our mission is to derive uh, innovation by connecting the brightest minds in the world uh, essentially, we are building a, we try to build a platform whereby uh, we can uh, have all of the stakeholders in the startup ecosystem collaborate in, in just this one uh, physical as well as virtual platform. Three things of what we do. First, we are a uh, venture capital. Okay? Uh, since the beginning, we have uh, uh, been investing in uh, early stage startup tech companies. 
And over the last five years, we've really accelerated uh, this uh, activity by uh, investing in over 200 companies uh, uh, per year. So we average <laughs> between 220, 230 investments per year. Last year, though, we slowed down a little bit because of uh, COVID. Uh, we did only 162. Uh, but uh, we uh, we uh, are very bullish about uh, this this uh, year 2021, and uh, we think that we will be uh, going up again to the 200 to 250 level. Over these uh, over these last uh, five years, we've uh, we've uh, accumulated maybe over 1,200 investments already so far. 60% uh, of it is still in the U.S. and 40% globally, but uh, hopefully we can uh, uh, balance that uh, ratio a little bit and do uh, more investments outside, especially here in, uh, in Asia. In Asia, including China, we have only about, I would say, 160, 170 investments so far and uh, in Southeast Asia uh, only about uh, 60 or 70. So we, uh, we uh, I, I personally feel that we have a lot of uh, investing still to do. Out of uh, our entire portfolio, we've been lucky enough to have uh, about, uh, actually we have 15 unicorns already. Uh, what you see here is 14, uh, 13 of them. Uh, the, we had our first unicorn for 2021 out of uh, South Africa, uh, a fintech company called uh, Flutterwave. Uh, we also uh, just found out that we have a 15th one out of China, but uh, unfortunately the news is not public yet. So but uh, uh, we're very happy for that 15th uh, unicorn. Uh, we think that uh, we will have maybe uh, three or four more additional unicorns. So we're crossing our fingers uh, before the year ends. The second uh, bucket of activities that we have is uh, corporate innovation. So uh, as you see here, we work with uh, uh, over uh, 520 corporate partners or uh, Fortune 500 companies all around the world. So essentially, uh, these companies come to us and share with uh, share to us their innovation strategies. Okay, and uh, uh, our part is to uh, present to them existing uh, technology solutions coming out of startups. Uh, that can fit into uh, what they're looking for. So uh, I remember a story with uh, uh, Hilton. Uh, a couple of years ago, uh, I was having lunch with the head of their innovation strategy and uh, or department. And uh, I asked this gentleman, so uh, why are you here? So he said, you know, Jojo, you know, Hilton is a hundred year old company. You know, uh, we have actual assets. We have uh, uh, our valuation is uh, about thirty billion dollars, and uh, here comes a startup. You know, less than ten years old. Okay, with no assets, uh, but they're also worth thirty billion dollars. And obviously, this guy was speaking about uh, speaking about uh, Airbnb. And uh, same same table uh, was the head of innovation of Lufthansa, okay? And uh, this uh, gentleman was telling me, you know, we have the same story, Jojo, you know? Uh, uh, Lufthansa is, is, uh, is, uh, is close to a hundred year old company. And uh, we're also uh, valued the, the, in, in the billions and here comes a company, you know, also uh, less than 10 years old, 
who's uh, more th- whose valuation is even actually more than us. And he was talking about Uber, you know, because he feels that they're both in the transportation space. Uh, same thing with Panasonic. Uh, I remember they, they said, you know, the last time we invented something was uh, the, uh, the, not the Betamax, but the VCD recorder. And uh, this gentleman was saying that, you know, we're actually here with plug and play because we, we this was maybe 10 years ago. Uh, they were interested in the EV battery sector. And uh, uh, interestingly enough, uh, that is actually the big, the biggest business right now of Panasonic. So they're the largest uh, supplier of uh, EV batteries uh, in the market. So a lot of these companies come to us to get this, uh, uh, to be in the front row seat of what innovation uh, and new technologies are available for, for their use. You know, and they come to us either to license these uh, uh, technologies, they can do uh, uh, pilot projects with these uh, startups. And uh, in, in some cases, uh, they may even invest, you know, in, in these startups, you know, because about 20% of the, of the uh, corporations that we work with have their corporate VC arms. So uh, their mandate is also to invest in, uh, to do strategic investments in certain startups. No? So uh, a lot of these uh, companies that we work with, they, uh, they are also uh, uh, very significant in their ecosystem in terms of uh, uh, investments. No? So it's not just with institutional VCs, but also with the CVCs, as you see here. Which leads me to my uh, now my uh, our third activity. Uh, we are now uh, the globally the largest uh, accelerator uh, for for tech startups. Uh, typically, we see about I would say north of twenty thousand startups a year globally, and uh, out of these. Out of these uh, 20,000, we accelerate uh, more or less about 10% of them are 2,000 startups per year. No? And uh, the acceleration programs that we have uh, cover these uh, industry uh, verticals. We have actually about 18 now. So uh, this slide may be a little uh, out, out of date, but uh, we have about 18 uh, industry verticals and it's uh it's pretty interesting uh uh for us to to organize it this way because you know it's uh we see a lot of uh, cross uh cross uh, vertical uh collaboration also no? so for example uh with uh, uh smart cities uh it, it's grouped with uh, real estate and construction. It's grouped with uh, energy and sustainability, as well as mobility, IoT, and health. And so uh, we run those programs, uh, uh, smart cities programs, for example, in about uh, five cities now worldwide. Here in Asia, we run it in in uh, or more more than five cities. I think about six or seven. Here in Asia, we run it in uh, Shanghai, in uh, Osaka, and in uh, Thailand, in Bangkok. So uh, to give you an example, uh, let's choose, for example, food and ag tech. So uh, as I said, our corporate partners in this vertical would come to us and say, uh, guys, we're looking for new technology. We are trying to solve or look for new technologies in uh, waste reduction, for example, or or uh, logistics and uh, asset tracing, uh, uh, it could be sustainable farming. No, uh, also for uh, small scale farming, which about ninety percent of which we experience here in Southeast Asia, they could be looking for uh, food manufacturing and uh, processing. You know, like. Uh, 
with Del Monte. This is what they're looking for, as well as uh, food packaging, uh, as well as uh, uh, consumer analytics uh, for uh, for big brands like uh, uh, AB uh, Brewery or Mars Chocolates or Coca-Cola, Pepsi, and uh, all those big brands. So uh, pretty much we are able to touch uh, many industries uh, uh, with, uh, with, uh, with a lot of our corporate partners. Uh, interestingly enough, I just got news that uh, we would be starting a space program which is based out of Kazakhstan. So I, I, uh, I just got the news today from our, uh, from our uh, guy uh, on on the ground. So it's it's a new it's a new space for us to uh, to uh, to explore. <laughs> so uh, let me bring it down a little bit to uh, what we're doing here in Asia Pacific. So we've actually been here for quite some time now, so more than 10 years now, as you can see here. But, uh, and that office started off in uh, Singapore. And uh, uh, that was actually a, uh, just for investment purposes. So uh, we were one of the, uh, we were one of the partners of uh, uh, National Research Foundation uh, to do uh, investments uh, in in Singapore, to do co-investments with the government. So uh, I came back here to Manila actually in 2013, uh, 2014, to uh, kind of plan out uh, our expansions here in Asia. And I'm happy to say that since then, uh, about four four years ago, we we started our first office in china and beijing and now we're actually in five offices this is this is also wrong apologies for that so uh we also have offices in uh wuhan uh, uh in china and uh, nanjing as well actually uh which is uh for uh, the food and ag tech uh vertical uh, Japan, we opened that about uh, three years ago in Tokyo, and since then we've expanded to Kyoto and Osaka, and we may expand uh, to Nagoya pretty soon uh, this year. Uh, Jakarta, we opened that about three years ago, uh, and that was very interesting because uh, it was actually President Widodo who came over and visited me in uh, uh, Plug and Play uh about uh, five or six years ago and uh on his way out he said you have to bring uh, plug and play to jakarta so uh, we were quite motivated to doing that bangkok we opened that uh, two years ago and uh, uh seoul we're actually launching it uh, this month so in a couple of weeks we're doing our soft launch and uh hong kong uh Hopefully this year, I'm still looking for uh, my general manager for for that for that uh, place. So, uh, in terms of uh, investments, uh, as you can see here, we've done actually close to sixty now, sixty investments here in uh, in uh, uh, Southeast Asia. Uh, if I'm not mistaken, we have about. And uh, about uh, uh, six or seven of that coming out of uh, uh, universities, or maybe even about ten of them. You know, if if I include Indonesia as well. So I just wanted to share with you a little video. Twenty twenty has been a year of unprecedented acceleration in the digital economy. The digital age has revolutionized everything, and words like disruption and innovation are today the status quo. In fact, the combination of disruption and innovation has helped us tackle very complex challenges, and is needed more than ever. 
marketplace, the world's largest open innovation platform. We work with more than 400 multinational corporations around the world to accelerate and multiply their corporate innovation efforts. In the last 10 years, we've been able to grow this global network in about 20 countries and close to 40 cities so far. Now, COVID-19 has plunged many of us into uncertainty. Nonetheless, we can still find some bits of optimism. For many people have framed COVID as the world's digital transformation officer. In fact, it is a good example of how businesses, especially startups, can pivot and thrive in challenging conditions. There's an increasing demand for the latest innovation and technology. Many of these startups have the capability and global applicability. And we also want to spread VC funding and the impact of innovation to solving big problems outside of large markets, but also into some of the more smaller fragmented markets in Southeast Asia. Collaboration is in There is no success in digital innovation without bringing people on the way right with you. Because another thing we have learned from this situation is our work, our daily work has changed. The way we interact with people, the way we work on projects and make things happen has totally changed. While well, advancements in technologies have been happening at unbelievable speed, it is no exaggeration to say that technology and innovation are literally changing our lives and habits. To say the least, the future looks very exciting. More than anything else, we are growing so rapidly into the relevance of our engagement with our corporate partners. And I'm excited to see a lot more growth and opportunities of engagement in the coming months. So uh, how do we engage uh, with, uh, oh, with universities? What sort of activities we do? So first and foremost, uh, they're our source for investments. No? Uh, uh, and I'll, I'll show you some examples uh, later on in the other slides. Uh, we like to, uh, as you, I also show you that we do a lot of judging of uh, their business plan competitions. Uh, very important, I think we connect uh, universities with industries, you know, as you saw in uh, in the video, you know, we have uh, all of these friendly relationships with, with, you know, not just here in Asia, obviously, but around the world with over 500 corporations. And uh, uh, they also kind of, you know, uh, look at us for, for sourcing these, uh, these uh, potential startups out of universities. Uh, we do a lot of uh, uh, events and, re and resource uh, uh, activities with, uh, with universities. Of course, you know, for those that uh, we, uh, we invest in, we do a lot of mentorships. And uh, they're a source of uh, internships for us, uh, not just for plug and play, but also for our, for our startups, uh, as, well as, uh, as well as employment. Uh, very close stories to my heart. So SoundHound, uh, as you can see here, started in 2005, but came to our building in 2006. Uh, so uh, I uh, remember Kayvon very clearly, uh, very, like it was yesterday, uh, four guys out, Kayvon himself, I mean, uh, with uh, three other guys from Stanford University, all, all doctors the, on uh, sound technology, and uh, we kind of not just gave them office space, but we helped them do their uh, fundraising, uh, especially their first money, uh, as well as uh, as uh, until until their latest round. No? So, uh, what they do, they they uh, their voice enabled AI conversational intelligence platform or tool. And as I said, in 2006, uh, through their Series A and Series B, uh, about five, uh, 12 or $15 million, we helped them uh, with that uh, 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 kind of bridging them to our VC network. And in 2018, uh, we brought them into our uh, Stuttgart uh, Autobahn uh, Accelerator and where they where Daimler fell in love with them and uh, Tencent as well, and they, they got a hundred million dollar uh, investment uh, at a one billion dollar valuation. So uh, 
Kayvon and I were still in touch actually until now. Uh, I introduced to him actually his wife. So uh, that's why we have a very quite a special relationship. Uh, Andrew, uh, actually I met Andrew when he was still in college. He was a sophomore uh, out of uh, Cornell, if I'm not mistaken. And, uh, and he had this uh, little startup that he founded while he was in school. It was an online learning platform. Uh, helped him with his seed monies, you know, over three years, uh, about $2 million. And uh, just this year, they raised uh, $70 million at the $1.1 billion valuation. So a little funny because uh, Andrew's father, Fred, is a good friend of mine. And uh, Andrew was uh, actually thinking of dropping out of school. And I had to uh, make sure to convince him to stay in school or else his father would kill me if he did. Anyway, so uh, just uh, examples of uh, uh, here uh, startups that we invested in coming out of uh, universities. I said we do a lot of uh, pitching competitions. No? So this is uh, actually a, uh, our year calendar for 2021. And as you can see here, you know, there's uh, not just uh, uh, startups that we source coming out of uh, U.S. universities, but also uh, from Europe and uh, uh, Asia, although very little activity from Asia. You can see here it's on December 8th you know, and they're all clumped together. So, uh, but uh, it kind of actually shows the the number of uh, st uh, startups coming out of uh, uh, US, Europe, and Asia. No? So, uh, but uh, you can see some here, like on, for example, on September 8th, we have with NUS and Nanyang. So, you no, know, but uh, again, uh, we'd love to, uh, uh, extend our network uh, here in Asia to to have more participation in uh, these uh, uh, pitch events that we are organizing. Some of the ex universities that we work here in uh, in in Asia, uh, in Southeast Asia, uh, Thailand, Indonesia, and Singapore. Some of the examples that uh, we do with NUS. So. <coughs> As I said, you know, we do a lot of recruitment from uh, from the university. We also do webinars and you know and and seminars, and we have our uh, team uh, do the, uh, the the keynotes and uh, and uh, resource speakers. Uh, and uh, with with Thailand here, for example, you can see that. Uh, uh, you know, we uh, we promote uh, the startup uh, industries in the universities locally. And here in Indonesia, some examples. Uh, uh, with uh, Saeed Amidi is actually, Saeed Amidi is uh, my partner and uh, uh, CEO and president. Another uh, case study that we did uh, with uh, uh, in China. This is an example of how we bridge uh, industry also with the university. So uh, there was a uh, business uh, problem uh, uh, case that uh, Hela, which is uh, a big uh, lighting and electronics company uh, that uh, uh, kind of gave us a reverse pitch, you know, what they were looking for. And uh, we we connected them with uh, Tsinghua University uh, to uh, to develop solutions. Here's uh, another story out of China, uh, a, uh, outing, which is a uh, uh, authentication technology that uh, we uh, identified out of uh, uh, university uh, from uh, doing uh, these uh, competitions. We invested in the company and uh, it, as you can see here, it's, 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 a, 
it, it gives us good return, you know. Uh, after after only a few years, uh, our investment uh, uh, grew by uh, 40 times. So uh, we like doing investments out of universities is what, uh, what I want to say. Uh, in Korea, we are now starting, as I said, uh, this this month uh, this month we're launching the office, but uh, we're already starting our uh, engage or our reach out to the uni to the to these three universities, and very interesting. I didn't know this, but uh, thirty five percent of the unicorns out of Korea are coming out of the universities. Now, so we we have these programs uh, of uh, lectures and networking. Uh, and uh, uh, partners with uh, with corporate partners, uh, uh, internship recruitment, you know, all of these programs that we're setting up with uh, these universities. Uh, <clears throat> I wanted to share this with you because uh, it's one of our most successful uh, acceleration programs out of. Uh, Stuttgart, and this is with Daimler Mercedes Benz, and they uh, 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 we do source a lot of uh, the technology or technology solutions and startups out of uh, universities and in, uh, out of the University of Stuttgart, and uh, this is uh, some of the this is some of the uh, startups that have gone through our program, but this is very interesting because Daimler. Uh, in 2016, they uh, we've been working with them for maybe 2014, 2015. But in 2016, at that time, Chairman Seche came to uh, to us and said, uh, "You know, uh, we plan to build this Arena 2036, which is going to be where it, and all of the new innovation in the Mercedes-Benz car will go uh, will be developed here." Um, and the, and particularly, he said, you know, Jojo, the, the thing is, um, Daimler is a is a uh, uh, is a great, is an excellent steel bender, okay, uh, and uh, you have to realize that today the value of the car is eighty percent uh, hardware and twenty percent software. Uh, in ten years' time, though, that's going to reverse. The value of the car is going to be eighty percent software and twenty percent soft. Uh, uh, twenty percent hardware, and he said, uh, "Though we're excellent steel benders, we really don't know software. No? So if you could find software for us that will address the connectivity of the car, the self-driving uh, uh, autonomous vehicle uh, technology, EV battery, and as well as ride sharing, uh, those were those were the those were the." Uh, 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 you know, problem statements that were given to us. And so uh, this was one of our uh, most successful ones. I think they've done already about uh, 40 or 50 pilot projects uh, over the last four years. And uh, as well, uh, they have commercialized, I think, three or five of these startups already inside the, inside the car. And uh, very recently, They've added to us, you know, they, they because of COVID, you know, uh, one of the things that we want that uh, they were asking us to help uh, to search solutions to to uh, for a, for a cleaner car, you know, so uh, uh, more, uh, fil air filters and all of those things, so, so that uh, the car inside doesn't get contaminated. And so uh, those are some of the things that uh, we've done, but the very very uh, uh, very very exciting. A program that we have here, and again, it's because of a really healthy relationship that that we set up together with the University of Stuttgart. And here in the so Philippines, John, just a time check. You have uh, about a minute left for your presentation. Okay, all right. Uh, just this is my this is my last slide. Uh, what are we doing here in the Philippines? So, uh, uh, as uh, uh, Nap said, that we uh, I have uh, Launch Garage, which is my uh, local accelerator here, and uh, my team uh, actually have uh, uh, 
uh, approached uh, DOST, uh, PCIERD, with the PBI programs to, uh, to, uh, to execute on this acceleration program uh, for, for startups, you know, looking for, for uh, 10 to 20 startups uh, per year that we can accelerate and, com and help commercialize. We did a pilot of this and uh, one out of the 10 that we did last year actually uh, got a 30 million peso uh, uh, investment. So we'd like to uh, institutionalize this uh, this year and in, in the next years to come. Uh, yeah, I just wanted to leave you with this thought. Uh, you know, uh, I, as, you know I, I love the story of Tamara and David and actually uh, these uh, studies are available online and but uh, and in just one generation how significant uh, significant uh, the, the economic impact of uh, of uh, innovation and entrepreneurship in just these two universities you know, so I think just two universities alone I, I think is already more than more than the entire or double, triple the, the entire uh, economy of the Philippines, which is kind of amazing if you think about it. You know? So uh, just, and and uh, again, these studies are available online. I think the one of Stanford, you can just buy for $100, you know, the book. And uh, I'd encourage everybody to just shame, shamelessly copy what they do. Uh, that's it. Thank you. Right, thanks, Jojo. My first question to you is after seeing maybe 100,000, di naman siguro 100,000, more than 10,000 startups over the last 10 years, do you, do you now see a pattern in terms of who will succeed and who will make it? What's the common characteristic among these uh, successful startups? You know, uh... I think a special still, ingredient. Yeah, because I think it's still fresh in all of our minds. I, I, I think you, you, you all, you all saw and met uh, Tamara and David <clears throat> earlier today. No, as early stage investors, we've all you, we've always used maybe seven, at least seventy percent of our criteria on the team. All right, uh, we like them, of course, to have to to have the smarts. Right, uh, they, 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 if they, if they can have uh, uh, that uh, domain expertise in what they're doing, like for example, Kayvon uh, on on sound technology, he's, he's a doctor in, he was a doctor in sound technology in Stanford, and so same thing with his team, and so so seventy percent on the the team, thirty percent on the idea, yeah, thirty percent, thirty percent on on the. The, 30, the remaining 30% on the technology itself. The technology you know, because itself. Because the technology itself is really not a, is not a competitive advantage, I think. No? And uh, we all know that there are, for example, when Google was started, when Google was starting, actually the search engine of Yahoo, according to experts, uh, were better than Google's. No, yeah. But we all know what were Google now versus Yahoo. Right. Yeah. Uh, so it, it, the technology is not the is not itself a competitive advantage, and uh, uh, as we know, that can change very rapidly. No, I mean, mm -hmm. uh, someone can invent a better thing uh, one month from now or. And in terms of now. the team, because you you placed seventy percent, no, on the team, is it uh, academic background? Other than that, obviously, ano pa yung ibang ingredients? That you look well, for uh, you know it, it's quite subjective but uh you kind of have to see that they know uh they you have to feel that they they can execute on things that they say they will execute on uh and maybe you know that's why i kind of do a lot of interviews uh you know on you know what's the most proudest uh, what's the proudest thing you've done in your life or how did you face a challenge or or uh, who do you admire most, you know, and why? And you know, all of these things, you know, I kind of dig into that, kind of see, is this an entrepreneur that's going to make it? You know, because it's not an easy, 
Is that an yeah. easy joke? Where do you get a lot of insights, no, from those questions? Yes, yes. You know, for example, you know, yung, uh, you know, uh, did you ever sell anything your, in your life? You know, even as yeah. a kid, you know, yeah. did you display any entrepreneurial skills? Yeah. Uh, uh, I look at the family background, you know, because, you know, can the family support this entrepreneur? The friends, you know, who are your friends in school? What are, you know, uh, who, who's the who's the most famous guy you've ever met in your life or girl you've ever met in your life? You know, how do you keep that relationship? Okay. You know, those are the questions that I ask, you know. I let my tangible story, you know, the young oh, characteristics yeah. person. Yeah, because at the end of the day, you know, for example, ha, huh, I remember the story. I wasn't involved, but with PayPal, with PayPal, uh, it was Said who was very excited about it. He said, "Jojo, you have to meet these guys. They're very, very smart, etc., cetera, etc." Cetera. Uh, <laughs> but the thing is, <clears throat> when they when we first put in money in them, what they were doing is moving money from uh, uh, Palm Pilot to Palm Pilot. You know, so the Palm Pilot was their wallet, was their e-wallet, kumbaga, no? And uh, they pivoted. Uh, they pivoted to what they are today, you know? And uh, I think it's because of, uh, you know, really brilliant guys, entrepreneurs, including Elon. Okay, so we'll talk more about those characteristics and the intangibles now later on. But at this point, Jojo, I'd like to bring in our reactors no, to help us further distill the things you are talking about. First, uh, first up is Dr. Alberto Guilio, Executive Vice President of the Polytechnic University of the Philippines. Dr. Guilio, are you there? Yeah. Ah, there. Good morning, Carlos. Good morning. Go ahead. Good morning. Good morning, uh, Sir Jojo. Uh, the presentation is truly insightful very encouraging and uh, exciting uh the it, it came at a time that is really uh relevant uh now that uh, the philippine economy uh, there is to be a much effort to prop up the the philippine economy uh, jojo has said rightly that inventions and innovations uh, truly drive uh, a country's economy and I guess the, the venture capital industry plays a crucial role in uh, as an engine of uh, uh, growth and development. So I think uh, the, the, the venture capital industry of venture capital networks will truly bridge the, the gap between the innovators and those who are providing capital so that as we said in our topic today from laboratory to life-changing situation so we do not want our products our intellectual uh, properties to just stay inside the four corners of the laboratory now um my my one concern uh here is that I looked at some statistics uh, uh, in 2018, there was a report uh, on uh, ve venture capital investments in uh, Southeast Asia. And, uh, and uh, it was reported that among countries in Southeast Asia, the Philippines received the, the, the smallest, no? a, a very small percentage of this venture capital investments uh, in fact in the first eight months of uh, 2018 the venture capital investments in southeast asia uh, startups no total 3.16 billion dollars but uh, sadly the philippines cornered only 50 million us dollars so from billions in southeast asia only millions went to the philippines and I believe the entry, the the participation of Jojo in the Philippines in the the venture capital uh, industry will uh, help uh, enliven the industry. But one thing I I, I notice is that uh, what I'm thinking about is that maybe since Jojo has already uh, operated in the country for 
for quite some time through his uh, launch garage uh, firm. Uh, you may have some observations already why why the Philippines uh, is at the tail end of this share of uh, venture capital investments. I read an article uh, that was uh, published or was released in October 2011 looking at the structure of the venture capital uh, industry in the Philippines. Uh, and it was stated there that uh, because the, the model of the Philippines uh, as a developing country uh, shows that the this agency problem is very evident. No, uh, That is the uh, mismatch or conflict between the goals of the principal and the goal of the, the agent. That article was released in 2011 and we are now in 2021. And I would like to see whether that is still connected with how the Philippines is performing now in terms of capturing uh, venture capital investments. And also in that same article, it was stated that venture capital investments in the Philippines go to mature industries and they don't go to startups. And I, 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 I would like to, to know also whether that is the same behavior that is being exhibited by the venture capital firms that go to the Philippines. And why do they go to mature industry and rather than supporting startups? So the data or the statistics that I shared with you would relate to startups, no? Only 50 million in venture capital funding went to the Philippines for startups. So maybe you can give us, enlighten us, why is this the data on the Philippines? Uh, thank you very much. Alam mo, Thank you, Guilio, na tinumbok mo na kagad yung isang malaking problema in our startup ecosystem. <laughs> and I can't wait to listen to how Jojo will answer that. But essentially, Jojo, how do we increase the interest in investing in startup companies no? and not so much in the traditional businesses that we have locally? How did the other countries do it? Siguro, that's a good starting point. Go ahead. Thank you very much for that. Very, and I'd like to answer it with with uh, with more on the positive side than 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 negative. No, let's let's be positive here. So and so we can uh, uh, so we all go home smiling. Uh, uh, first, you know the 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 proportion of what of how much money we got out of the three billion that was invested. In, uh, in in 2018 uh i think that first of all it has improved already i think i don't have the numbers but if i remember correctly in tw in 2019 that that number had improved a little bit but it's still low it's still low and but we have to consider out of the, the three the three billion po kasi uh marami doon were worse were were not new investments they were follow on investments in large companies already so for example uh just uh just uh just this week uh bukalapak uh in indonesia one of their unicorns just got a 260 million dollar investment from microsoft okay from microsoft ventures so medyo nag skew yung data no pag pero kung titingnan natin yung yung num pero uh, hindi pa rin ano hindi pa rin yeah. yeah hindi pa rin pantay because the when you look at the number of deals yes we're still behind when you look at the deals made on first first time investments yes we're still behind now so the pro the challenge is the challenge is there okay i don't want to i i don't want to sugarcoat it you know but uh, that the, it's not that big of a uh, of a uh, problem kasi wala kasi tayong ano eh wala kasi tayong uh, unicorn eh uh, our biggest investment so far was what happened uh, uh, the investment that was done on on globe uh, on on gcash uh, there was a 170 million 75 million dollar investment on gcash now if we consider gcash now as a startup then that will improve our numbers okay so so let's put that now aside, no? Now, but what, uh, 
So quick question, Jojo. Should we start with local venture capitalists before we look outwards for bigger funding from the Microsofts? Because we have Ayala yeah, and MVP. Yeah. Well, uh, un unfortunately, what we're lacking in the country are the early stage, early stage investors. Okay, meron na tayo nung mga later stage eh. kasi nandiyan nga si Active Fund ng Ayala, uh, nandiyan si for example sila Gentry oh, ng SM ng SM, nandiyan ang uh, JG, JG Dev, no? They do investment sa JG Summit. So may mga CVC na tayo na nag invest in pero most of them are doing still later stage. Yeah. Ang yung early stage, sino dapat ang nag invest or mga in, uh, mga corporate ano yan eh mga uh, rich rich uh, rich uh, high net worth individuals no high net worth individuals uh, uh, and you can find that actually sa Stanford the study says that they they have, have a very robust community of alumni and entrepreneurs that help the startup no uh, and and that has always been my challenge. I, I think each individual that can shell out 1 million, 10 million, 20 million pesos a year without. These are the low hanging fruits of the of, of the in, of the early stage investors. If you want to bring it down to the university, because the university obviously will have a, real, a closer relationship with these alumni reach. These rich katulad nung teaching competition no na uh, 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 create an event oh. yes oh, exactly okay. create, yeah, a platform, yeah. create, a, create an event na magfe-feature nitong mga startups and I, I think among all of the in the audience here we're looking at a million students no at uh, maybe right I, I'm a million students I, I'm sure we can find 1,000 of those that uh, 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 would put put up kung, kung two founders per team 500 startups no na pwedeng pagpilian I, i'm sure maganda oh, yeah, oh. and the, uh, the entry level naman is uh, it's uh, 5 1 million to 5 million maybe 10 yes, million at most maski maski yung uh, siguro para lang ma let's say give them 6 months to productize kailangan nilagay mo na mabilis no 6 months to product productize well depending on the technology but kung software 3 months pwede na nga eh no uh, tapos yeah. sabihin mo sa kanila oh uh, ito 100,000 pesos para lang ma-productize ninyo yung magkagawa kayo na MVP so may mga ganyan mga ano, magandang strategy yan yeah, yeah. Let, going going back strategy to, going back to yung yung how can we increase the interest no kasi uh, the challenge is also there's economic problems. No, we all know, naman na, na our students, uh, our uh, our population, especially the ones that go through the universities, pagkatapos silang maggraduate, they find a job. No, it's not, and uh, uh, their own business is not necessarily a job in the eyes of in the eyes of their parents. No, so. Uh, your social obligation is still stronger to find a job, you know, a, 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 a regular paying job rather than a uh, rather than a doing a startup. But and that's always been at least my advocacy. If this if the uh, if if we can if we can find really talented students, no, uh, sa last slide ko. Uh, we're actually I'm actually putting together a 10 million dollar early stage fund okay that will only focus on all these early stage investments that I can that I want that I want to find among the among the universities that's great no? that's uh, from your personal funds yeah and some friends also some friends okay that yeah. will be matched by uh, Dr. Al Serafica Para oh, I, times two. Pagdating kay Al, times, times two. two. Al, oh, okay, pinangako na kita. <laughs> no, but that's great, Jojo, kasi that's really where uh, we don't have any funding coming in. No, I was thinking government should do the early yes, stages the government, investment. Cover, cover, actually, I, I had a meeting with National Development Corporation. They're funding the Startup Venture Fund, which is a $5 million 
as early stage fund. Uh, so I, I had a meeting with them uh, and uh, I'm going to be a, a help, try, I will try to help in uh, finding deals and doing due diligence on, 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 on investable, on investable uh, deals. No? Uh, but also I, I want to point out, the thing is, you know, uh, what, where we're lagging behind also versus the region and the world is our corp our, our corporate uh, corporate uh, uh, involvement no uh, I see we here uh, in, in 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 the Philippines more than anywhere else you know corporations tend to uh, try to solve their problems on their own okay so they try to build products on their own when it really it's not their, sometimes it's not their core competency, okay? Uh, let's say, for example, you're in real estate, tapos gusto mong gumawa ng CRMs na para uh, that can, uh, or, or software para makakuha ng deal flow, para makolekta mo yung mga bayad sa'yo, yung, yung, yung that part, the, the tendency is for them to build it themselves when it's not your core competency. The thing is, there are already existing existing uh, products that are pressed that are already built and working from startups. So that's why a go good to... point. That's a good point. In fact, what you're saying is a second strategy, as I understand it, and that is when you build your startup. You can build it within a, an existing company by solving their problems. Absolutely, okay, and that's, that's that's perfect. That's, that's why you know that we, we, you know uh, I think the reason why at least you know uh, a lot of the universities around the world like working with us is because they already know that we have that relationship and that bridge with with the corporations, and we address. Uh, we address uh, uh, existing pain points that they're experiencing. For example, Correct. one of our Correct. we have one corporate partner here at Fill Invest, okay, Fill Invest Group, and uh, uh, we're just trying to find a date. But they already said yes. The head of innovation is named Savior, and uh, we're putting together a roundtable session, uh, and it's going to happen. Uh, I think mid May, okay, if I'm okay. not mistaken. Wala right. pa lang, wala pa lang date eh. Wala pa but, date. But uh, I, uh, I invited already the top 15 uh, technology business incubators out of PCIERD. Okay. okay. The, so the, 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 the heads of these uh, TBIs will have this roundtable session with Phil Invest. Phil Invest will do a reverse pitch. Okay. They'll, they'll like tell that. them. So yung mga problema namin, who can solve it? Yes, yes. Okay. Sorry, Jojo, kayo... I have to move on. Ha? Pero alam mo, that's a really very important point that you made, the second strategy and making sure that the researchers and uh, companies actually meet up. No? Hindi <laughs> magkakilala kasi ito eh. And speaking of innovation, I'd like to bring in engineer Albert Amante, a good friend of IRIS, one of the stalwarts of... Uh, Batanga State University's innovation program. And they are really gung-ho uh, in terms of finding all the industry collaborations that they that they can so that their researchers actually work on the, the pro problems of these uh, industry partners. So I'll bring in uh, Engineer Albert. Thank you, VP Guilio. Don't, uh, no, don't go anywhere. Uh, continue lang tayo. Thank you. Thank you. President and our University President, Dr. Chris Ronquillo, Doug and Play co-founder, Mr. Jojo Flores, to my co-panelists, and of course, uh, Dr. C.P. David. Dr. C.P. actually was the Executive Director of the Shirt with our TBI got funded. Thank you very much for the opportunity, sir. So it's my pleasure to give my insight and reaction to one of, the, of my innovation heroes whom I look up to, Mr. Jojo Flores. Actually, sir, our first encounter was on October 2018. I don't know if you still remember, but I wrote you a letter requesting if a delegation of uh, from Philippine universities can visit Dalim Day. And without hesitation, you agreed. 
during that time, I think we were, uh, I was with the university president, Dr. Jason Ophelia, and with some other representatives to benchmark the setup and management of technology business incubators, innovation hubs, and technology parks in the United States. That was through a funding from CED Institutional Development Innovation Grant with support from Field of Development Foundation. So Jojo, I think you were in the Philippines during that time, so you endorsed us to Megan and Andrew Chang. I can still remember their names. So they gave us a half-day tour of the facility and even discussed with us the programs of plug and play and the services you guys offered. That's indeed one of the most memorable experiences that I had in that study visit. To be able to visit an innovation hub co-founded by a Filipino technopreneur, University. So after the Silicon Valley visit, President Tirsen and I also got to visit the Research Triangle Park, one of the most uh, prominent high-tech research and development parks in the U United States, anchored by three major research universities. Pretty unique model. We have out there three universities, North Carolina State University, Duke University, and University of North Carolina. The 21, we are very happy to say that our innovation programs in the university have been accelerating, learning from the experiences with very able mentors. Like what, like what I always say, we always had the needed help. So as an institutional program, we've been continuously supporting startups through the Center for Entrepreneurship and Innovation with generous funding from the USDP Shared Shed and USD Calabarzon. Today, the center has trained more than 10,000 students and faculty members since it is an institutional program of the university. And even other state universities and colleges in Calabarzon, Mimaropa, and Bicol have incubated close to 70 startup teams, majority of which are coming from the Calabarzon region. On March 2020, during the pandemic, the university got its proclam presidential proclamation of the Knowledge, Innovation, and Science Technology Park, or KISS Park. It's the very first special economic zone under the category under that category of PESA. So KISS Park, which is located in our engineering campus at Alangil, Batanga City, aims to spur industry and academic collaboration towards innovation development through research collaboration, resources sharing, and product development. As the KISS Park is still in the development stage, we are now accepting locators in the five-story science, technology, engineering, and environment research hub, or STEER hub, which is also located in Batsk State, Yualang, England. I'm happy to say that we already have our first PESA locator, a Filipino-owned company, the PITOS Technology Philippines Incorporated. So PITOS is a pioneer in electronics hardware design and development and applications firmware development in the country. So PITOS has been... Uh, working with faculty researchers in the design and development of two timely cutting-edge technologies. First one is Airlock 389, which is this product, which is a patented graphene-based air purification technology integrated in the AV100, the very first antiviral-based shields. So it offers the high protection against airborne pathogens while providing comfort, visibility, readability, even with prolonged use. So the problem that pilots actually encountered actually is with regards to their application for FDA. And we're able to assist them in solving that uh, problem through uh, uh, a simple modeling and uh, 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 simulation using FDA. So on the other hand, PyTrace is a whole ecosystem of detection, mitigation, and contract tracing. So with this partnership between KeySpark and PyTOS and some other uh, industries in the future, we want to set an example for industries and even startups to collaborate with ease and flexibility with the university. Ernie Nieras, who is the chairman and CEO of PITOS, like very much the structure of KISS Park that encourages companies to come up, to come in, do innovation, create technology, and share technologies. So, um, so that's basically the, uh, uh, I think somehow similar, uh, the things that I've learned at Plug and Play. I can still remember there's one specific room full of uh, spaces specifically for industries. That's, that's something that we would like to see. In, in the case part uh, moving forward. Uh, I have a question for Sir Jojo. Uh, no. uh, I know that you've uh, a lot of uh, technology business incubator managers are also here uh, listening probably. We don't have very much accelerators in the, in the country, but uh, can you give advice to the Philippine technology business incubator managers, especially those coming from universities in terms of managing uh, the programs of their uh, DBIs? And also for those who have yet to, let's say, put up their own technology business incubators, I believe we have also a lot of presidents who are here. How important is the technology business incubator uh, to be set up in the university? Sir? 
Great question, Albert. In fact, papahirapin ko yung question kay Jojo. You're a, you're a TBI manager. And you already know that your uh, one of your startups will not uh, will not flourish and will not work. No, do you continue to advise them and to go for it, or tell them right away, pivot or uh, forget about your your product? Go ahead, Jojo. Yeah, great question. Thank you very much for that. Uh, uh, we are in the we are also in the acceleration business, no? And acceleration goes both ways. Uh, acceleration for you to be successful, and acceleration for you to fail. And uh, it's also part of uh, we should not uh, we should not uh, be scared of, of of failure, if it is uh, and and uh, uh, because if you you already see the signs, I I, I we have to to. Yep. <laughs> change something either you change the team you change the product you change the business model etc etc okay so but we have to accelerate that that part of that failure and then pivot and then hopefully it goes up again now uh, yun, Jojo, accelerate that if you're failing might as well do it quickly and then exactly. okay. <laughs> for, example, for example when when we show uh, startups to investors Tapos pagkatapos ng lima pa lang, pare-pareho yung feedback nila na mali yung business model, for example, o mali yung product market fit. Uh, bakit pa namin pagpapatuloy? No? Uh, Mag-pivot muna kayo, baguhin nyo muna bago tayo magpatuloy kasi accelerated na eh. So, uh, Sabi ni Roy Ponce, fail fast. Yeah. Exactly. Uh, that's And the whole then concept. bangon ka agad or pivot. Yeah. You know, uh, again, you know, I yung yung uh, uh, what, what suggestions for for TBIs this is you know we can take another whole day for it no uh, but uh, please ganito na lang para mabilis please reach out to me uh, my uh, my uh, email address is jojo at uh, pnptc.com so papa norway papa Tango. Okay, type na rin sa chat box, Jojo, so everyone can get it. Type it oh, there. Jojo. Uh, uh, sa chat box, so everyone can get it. Pero Albert, alam mo, doon sa learning trips na ginawa ninyo ni President Tier, so it's really nice to know that uh, something came out of it. And that you now have a PESA area in Batsu and you now have locators and so on. So in the discussion, I'd like to bring in Al Serafica. I'm sure maraming sasabihin si Al. We only have a few minutes left. Al is, of course, part of the scientific board of the IRIS, among the many other hats that, that he wear, wears. So Al, anong takeaway, bagong takeaway mo sa narinig mo from Jojo? Actually, uh, for you guys out there, this is an example of an excellent technology business incubator manager, Jojo. May kwento siya sa bawat isang startup na dumaan sa kanya. Ilang libo yun? Ganun karaming kwento niya. So number one yan. So to be a good PBI manager, guys, you have to know what the models for your startups are. Sino ba yung benchmark nila? Kung nasa agri sila, sinong gagayahin? Kung nasa search engine sila, sinong gagayahin, may kwento dapat kayo. So that's for the PBIs. Jojo is a living example of that. But what I like about plug and play is it did focus on the two other aspects of the ecosystem for entrepreneurship that's not being addressed adequately. Uh, in the Philippines, Jojo and I came back about the same time in 2013. We've been helping LaSalle and UP at UP Enterprise. We've been lockstep in everyone, but I'm more focused on the academic space. And with my consultancy with Stride, we funded a half a billion pesos worth of projects in the countryside development initiative of USAID for funding the universities to create projects, get used to doing research. The follow-on should have been, based on that research, we should have started making applications and startups and spin-offs. So whenever I describe the ecosystem or the transition for translation of 
research, it starts in the university in a 4 by 100 race. Tayo yun, mga kasama nating mga presidente dito. Yun ang ecosystem natin. First 100. We do research, we help students, we teach them, we make them entrepreneurs if they're interested, we capacitate them, and then give them the models. Yun ang trabaho nating mga academics as uh, institutions. But more importantly, we need to generate, like Israel generates 4,000 startups. We need to start counting. Kami ni Jojo sa UP, ilan na lumalabas? Wala pang dalawang po. Ang laki-laki ng funding, 800 may, uh, UP gets funded about 2 billion a year. How many startups and spin-offs? Dalawa, tatlo. Nakakaiyak. Lasal, as much as I wanted to say, it's nice, but it's the same case. It's not that many and their babies are ugly. Sorry guys, but... Kanyan talaga kami na brutal ni Jojo. Sa PUP, saka sa... TIP at Batsu will probably do a better job. Pagagaling sa akin yung mga kaya UP. Very, very... Yun ang sinasabi ni Jojo when he looks at people and startups. Kaya palagi kong punchline. Kanyang three Ps. Team. Technology, attraction. You know, palagi sila sabi. Palagi kini ka kasi yon. So, but more than anything else, is that the team indeed is composed of very dramatic part of the ecosystem of startups. We need more seeds to be planted, and we need those seeds to grow. Jojo is part of watering those seeds, and part of the water should come from the corporate business environment where he is also very. I tried to put up Philippine Business for Science and Technology. I got nowhere because. Iwahiwalay pa, fragmented pa yung mga interest sa mga businesses here. In education, they're united, but not in SNP. We need to change that. So part of that effort should be done. Initiatively, we have Philippine Business for Education, kayo mga university, 700 strong, where Philippine Business is supporting efforts in the education space. We should do that for SNP as well. We're here to help and show you the, the models and the examples. And Jojo, again, is a perfect example of the wealth of knowledge that plug and play has accumulated over this what 15 years i've been an entrepreneur for 25 and i see the development of those multiple startups of, of plug and play to be amazing considering i i i started my business and really became really patient about raising capital but um, everything is i have a amazing. question for you and jojo hmm. uh, one one of our uh, uh audience members as saan ba dapat tayo nag-focus ng startup development? I mean, in what sector do you think? So, so I'll start with you, Al, and then go to Jojo. And uh, uh, well, I mean, you have to look at it from an ecosystem level kasi CP. Eh. Saan ba pinakamarami more likely magagaling yung mga buto? Baka mayroong uh, low-hanging fruits. Uh, so, well, there are some initiatives in the, uh, I, like I always tell Louis Season, I focus on AHEM, kasi si Jojo palagi nasa ICT sa mga apps at apps. Ako yung AHEM ko, Agriculture, Health, Education, Environment, Energy, and Materials. Yan, may hirap punuin lahat yung mga, okay. yan, kasi it takes time, three to five Agriculture, years to develop. Agriculture, Health, product. Environment, Ahem. Ahem. Tatlong E. Ahem, tatlong E. And ah. ano yung M? Materials. Materials. Oh, How about you, Jojo? Uh, Jojo. 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 Ano I, I'd, like to, I'd like to address that question. Yung ano ba yung pwede nating gawin uh, na mga solutions, technology solutions that can affect the world. No? Because it, I have to look at it that, we have to look at it that, we have to think big. No? Not, only for, not only for the Philippines, but something that's, that can be a global product. So to answer to, to answer that, I think we are strong in our OFW, OFW, uh, our, our, that, that vertical is very strong, and they have a lot of pain points. Pain points in remittance, security, recruitment, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And I think we have to do a lot of products that address that, and then, if it because if it if it is if it if it solves the problem then it solves immediately the 10 million filipinos outside of the philippines and then there are also a hundred million other uh, Philip, uh, uh, overseas workers 
not, uh, that are not Filipinos. You're talking about Mexicans, Chinese, Indians, Indonesians, etc., etc., etc. No, uh, even from uh, uh, Eastern Europe. So, you the same the same solutions you can now apply to to, to those overseas workers. So that's number one. I, so number look two, for the pain points and solve those problems. Okay. Yes, yes. Number two. So that, that particular industry. Second one is uh, we also are strong in our BPO industry, especially voice-based. Okay, everybody's talking about AI, no? So uh, we have to be, we have to leapfrog that, uh, leapfrog that, and have solutions already that solve uh, BPO problems that that we current that, that we're currently experiencing. I heard, for example, that, that there's 50% attrition in the BPO industry. Okay, they maybe they maybe are moving from one company to another, but can you imagine that headache? Uh, and the tapas sinasabi nila to get to get to that one hire, you have to look at 20 people, and then that whole process is taking weeks and months. You know, we have to find solutions that will address that specific problem. And it affect it hits two birds with one stone. It protects our industry, and at the same time, you you have technology solutions that address those particular uh, particular services or sectors. And and thirdly, I I agree with uh, with uh, with Al, sa agricultural and, and and food and agriculture. Because <clears throat> for example, I go to Silicon Valley. I'm raising ten million dollars for this startup. Tapos tinanong nila sa akin, what does it do? Oh, it's social it's social media. Screw you, Jojo. I mean, you're going to fight with Facebook and Instagram and all of these guys, you know, versus if I go there and say I'm raising $10 million for this for this uh, solution that uh, yung, yung productivity... Food production. Isang, yeah. Digital agriculture. <laughs> yeah. Increase by 50% or 100%. Or yung time para tumubo is decreased by, you know, by 50%. Tapos sinanong nila, saan na-develop yan? Ang ah, na-develop to sa Pilipinas. Ah, masarap ang mangga dyan. Kilala namin. Oh, sige, maniniwala kami. no So parang you know, take advantage of uh, your advantages oh, already. Yes. Oh, yes. Ah, yes. okay. I think, I mean, that's, that's, I mean, don't try to solve. Huwag ka naman mag-social media kasi ang daming gumagawa niyan. Oh, tapos meron pa akong mga naririnig, mga semi-conductors, you know, Maski AI, yung mga ganyan, naku, lal, ano, lalaban ka sa ano? Lalaban ka dun sa mga funded funded ng gobyerno na 10 billion dollars? Paano malalabanan yun? Lumaban ka kung saan ka pwede lumaban. Okay, that, that Kaya, is a uh, very yes. practical, yes. ano? Yes, yeah. And, and, and the, I like the fact that you said that it hits two birds with one stone because you make the industry, an existing industry, even more competitive Absolutely. and protect the no that market that belongs to Absolutely. you right now that's perfect okay final words jojo before we close our webinar also uh, Alpha, meron kang gustong isingit. <laughs> again again uh, i thank you very much for 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 you cp al nap for for inviting me this uh, this morning i i really love uh, speaking uh, in this sort of platforms now because I, I think all of you are enablers are are influencers uh, in, in your own uh, circles of uh, communities and uh, I, again I go back to to the power of uh, what uh, uh, in that last slide that I showed with MIT and and, and Stanford how these two schools or just even just one school, uh, over a period of uh, you know 30 40 years have uh, have produced companies and founders and entrepreneurs and technologies that not only help the world that not only build uh, employment but also uh, really move the needle uh, in terms of uh, economic impact no uh, we saw that with with, with Stan Stanford's Stanford's uh, companies alone and these are 40,000 companies of Stanford uh, you know 10 times bigger than the entire GDP of the Philippines that's amazing I mean I think that's amazing and, and I think we're sitting in a gold mine here uh, if we want to measure success 
I, I think it's very easy to, to see 1,000 startups coming out of all of the universities in the Philippines. It's easy, 1,000 startups, you know. Uh, I think we have more than 2,000 universities in the country and we're not talking about, you know, we're not, we're even talking about 0.5 per, 0.5 startup per, per university. That, that I think it's so, the, the, that goal is so easy to, to, to make. And I think uh, uh, we, we are, we, we really are sitting on a gold mine here, but it's all about execution, you know, like what these guys said, uh, Mark and, uh, and Tamara, uh, David, sorry. Uh, you know, they, they can have, they can go through that process, you know, that process is defined but you know at the end of the day it's execution and that's what i like to see also you know I mean, that's great uh, putting things to me it's but again so that's there great. and thank personally you. jojo i'd like to thank you and of course al and edna for being the halige in our startup innovation program in the country you don't know this jojo but in 2013 the very first plug and play a pitching competition that was held. You know, the first prize there uh, went to a company called GS Metrics, which myself and Louis Season Bata pa ako nun, uh, are part of. <laughs> so we look up to you already you know, at that time. Maraming salamat, Al, VP Guilio, of course, our friend uh, from Batsu, VP Amante, of course, President Gascon, Rem, thanks very much. Dr. Baleta, and of course, David, and Tamara, and Jojo, of course. Maraming salamat, everybody. I'd like to bring in Nap quickly for last words, but thank you, everyone, for joining our webinar. Thank you. <clears throat> yeah, thank you. Thank you very much, everybody, and all the attendees. This is exactly what happens to the Philippines when we get all our brains together. And so, and, and oh, our nice. reactors, certainly some oh. of the brightest Filipinos okay. out there, President Gascon, VP Guilio, Dr. Rev Juanico, oh, no, great no, to good. meet you. Okay. And of course, Dr. Al, everybody else, Engineer Amante. This is exactly what we want to envision as well, Jojo. You know, the Philippines is not as helpless as we want, 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 want to perceive it to be. You know, this is a this is an archipelago of very bright minds, and I think if Tamara and David can uh, see some gold mine out of coconut husk, or uh, there, there's certainly other things that we too can think about. Well, um, ladies and gentlemen, our next event is again not uh, having having learned from Jojo and Tamara and David. You know, the Nordic Chamber of Commerce has volunteered to also talk to us. And so the four ambassadors of Sweden, Denmark, Finland, and Norway are going to grace the fourth and fifth series of the uh, Le Leadership Legacy Forums. And the title of that is Northern Lights, <laughs> Innovation and Human Capital in Sweden, Norway, Finland, and Denmark. And they're also going to bring in the heads of their research institutes and universities. And so this is a great opportunity again for mo for uh, university leaders, uh, both in public and private sector, our scientists and researchers, our faculty to learn from our global counterparts and also to kind of keep on advancing uh, our discourse and our mindsets and to keep on pushing the needle and as Jojo said you know learn from our failures learn from the failures of others you know there are no easy solutions but then again you know we plot on and uh, go for success and so Jojo thank you very much for this uh, very you yeah you, you're the pride of the Philippines if there is uh if I can confer you with the order of Sikatuna I will <laughs> but we don't have that power <laughs> but, uh, <All> right. <laughs> <laughs> but I can I can take you and uh, we can have some good wine together. Uh, so to all our attendees, thank you for continually uh, patronizing this legacy forums. We appreciate your presence and we hope to see you again in the fourth and fifth series. Northern Lights, this time from Scandinavia. 
And uh, for, for those in the audience and even our panel members, if you found something interesting and helpful in our webinars uh, being organized by IRIS, uh, remember that you can always engage IRIS in uh, other activities if you want to learn more uh, about design thinking with David and Tamara, we can organize that for you. And definitely if you want to learn and uh, no, parang uh, suck all the information out of Jojo Flores, then you can contact Iris and uh, we'll bring Jojo Flores to you in the flesh. Okay? Electronically. Thank you, everybody. <laughs> Thank you. Thank, Thank you, guys. Good. Have a good day. Stay Take safe. Care. Be safe. Be safe. Yeah. Bye. Thank you very much, Paul.